Want to be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something more inside you too. You've got Michael Jordan level genius at something. So today, let's live your best belief life and get some incredible motivation from the one and only Bob Proctor. Enjoy. I want you to think of this for a moment. Let's suppose there was a virus going around. And this virus caused people to really stunt their growth, ruin their income, and cause them to mix with people who are on the wrong track. And it was a virus, and there didn't seem to be any prescription to solve the problem. We would be in panic state. We would be looking everywhere for some kind of a prescription to fix and kill this virus. Well, do you know that's what a paradigm is? A paradigm is a program that is lodged in your subconscious mind, in your innate mind. It has been placed there genetically from the moment of conception. All mom's DNA and all dad's DNA is your DNA. And then there's an attractive force set up. And when you are born, then your environment becomes part of the paradigm. Why do you think so many people are struggling? Why do you think only three or 4% live a truly full, wealthy, meaningful life? It's because everybody is caught up in the paradigm. When I started to study this, when I started to understand it, it just about blew my mind. And then when I found out I could change it, I could take a pen and write my own paradigm and live the way I really wanted to live, I almost found it hard to believe. You know, the law of success is a pretty interesting concept. There's been books written on it, stories told on it. Lives have been spent looking for it. Let's understand that everything operates by law. The whole universe operates by law. The best definition of success I have ever heard was one that Earl Nightingale originated way back 1959. He said, success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Well, let's break that down for a moment. Success is the progressive, continually moving, progressive realization, constant awareness of a worthy ideal. An ideal is an idea that you have fallen in love with. An ideal is an idea that you're intellectually, emotionally, and physically involved with. An ideal is an idea that you've fallen in love with. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. So you don't ask, are you worthy of the idea? Are you worthy of the good? Is it worthy of you? Now, now you're getting in to the law of success. Is it worthy of you? You see, what you're going to do is trade your life. You're trading your life for whatever it is you're going after. So you want to make up your mind, whatever your goal happens to be, whatever you are pursuing, Make certain it's worthy of you because you're chain trading your life for it. The law of success calls for you to continually move in toward a predetermined objective in life and bringing your life in harmony with the laws that govern the entire universe. Think of this for a moment. Do you know that every living soul gets exactly the same amount of time? Exactly the same amount of time. Figure it out. You get all there is. A hobo sleeping under a bridge or on a park bench that has no material possessions, none, does nothing of any constructive nature. That person gets exactly the same amount of time as the most productive industrialist in the world. We all get exactly the same amount of time. So it's what we do with the time that makes a difference. I want you to think of the number of time management programs. Almost everyone under the sun has time management programs. In fact, I made one one time, spent a lot of money on it. And then I found out it was a dumb waste of time and money. Do you know why? Time can't be managed. I was having breakfast with Earl Nightingale one morning and um, it was downtown Chicago, and I was going with him on a speaking engagement, and it was early in the morning. He said, you want to meet for breakfast? 
Whenever Earl Nightingale said, you want to meet me, I was there, and I always had some well-prepared questions. And I remember asking him, I said, Earl, how did you learn how to master time management? You know, we're having breakfast. I can still hear his fork hit the plate. He said, what the hell are you talking about? He said, I've never mastered time management. Nobody masters time management. He said, time can't be managed. He said, I merely manage activity. And he took a little card out of his pocket. And he said, every night before I go to bed, I write down six most important things I have to do tomorrow. These are goal achieving activities. And when I wake up, that's what I start working on. And if I don't get them all done, I'll add them to tomorrow's list. He said, you should have about six. Now, if I have three that I didn't get done today, that doesn't mean I have nine for tomorrow, like six plus these three. Those three become part of the six you have to do the next day. When you wake up, you give all your conscious attention to do those things. See, you cannot manage time, but you can manage activity. You can manage your activities. Make certain that what you're doing really makes a difference. Make certain that you're spending your time on activities that are productive, that are taking you in the direction of your goal. I uh, met a man here in Toronto. He was one that originally got me involved in studying this, Ray Stanford. And he told me if I didn't like the results I was getting in my life, mm -hmm. that I was going to have to change me because there were my results. And he said, if you're going to change you, you're going to have to find out something about yourself. Ah. And that seemed to make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it was an earth-shattering idea. It wouldn't give anybody a brain hernia, but it made a hell of a lot of sense to me. So I started to study myself. I found most people don't know who they are. They really don't. What do you mean? I mean, I know my name, I know my age, I know where yeah, I live. Yeah, that's not what you, else though. Is there? You know, that, that, that's know just size, that. If you ask the average person who they are, they'll give you their name. They'll say, I'm Bob Proctor, but I'm not. Bob and Proctor are two words. My parents give them to me. They're called names, but it's not me. It's my name. Then somebody will say, well, this is me, but this isn't me either. It's my body. Like, you never phone down here to the, to the studio and say, body won't be in today. It's sick. Okay. You know, we don't say am hand or am leg. It's my hand, my leg, my body, my name. Who am I? Well, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. And I believe if a person will start to study that and look for the answer, they'll find it. See, I think we live simultaneously on three planes of understanding. We're okay. spiritual creatures. We have an intellect, and we live in physical bodies. Okay. But because we lack awareness or understanding of who we are, we're totally locked into a physical world, and we let things outside of us control us. 95% of the population are reacting to life. They're not really living at all. I don't think you determine what your purpose is. I think you discover what your purpose is. There's a difference. Determining indicates deciding. Um, and I don't think you decide. I think if you go about it the right way, you discover it. Like there's some people that should be painting all day. They're great artists. I think Michelangelo was obviously a great artist, a great sculptor. I mean, that was his purpose in his life. Well, I believe my purpose is doing what I'm doing. Your purpose is why you get out of bed in the morning. Do you know why you get up? Well, most people say, well, it's to go to work. Well, that'd be a good reason to stay in bed. You know, you say, well, everybody's doing it. That'd be another reason to stay in bed. If you're ever doing what everybody's doing, you're probably going in the wrong direction. Your purpose is your reason for living. What you want to do is sit down and maybe take a pen and a pad and then Ask yourself, what do I really love doing? Now, you may have to spend a while at this. You might get up an hour early every morning and go sit under a tree somewhere if you're in a nice climate or pick a favorite chair, someplace where you're not going to be disturbed and totally relax and say, if I could spend my life doing something what do I really love doing? Now, since you don't ask yourself that question every day, it might take a while for this answer to come to the surface. But it comes to your consciousness. And it may take a while. You may have to do this every morning for three months. But it would be well invested, the time. How many times have you had somebody say to you, hey, have you got a minute, Bob? 
Have you got a minute? They don't want a minute. I want you to think about that. I read a poem one time. It said, I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it. It was forced upon me. I can't refuse it. I didn't seek it and I didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it. It's only a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Well, at any rate, I thought, I'm going to put this on a video, and I'm just going to share it with everybody, just this one little part out of the seminar I'm making. I want you to look at this sand timer, and let this, I want you to think about your life. The sand in the top of the glass represents the future. The sand in the bottom of the glass represents the past. Now, do you know, we know what's in the past, and yet we can't do anything about it. Do you know what the trick is? You don't know how much sand's in the top of the glass. You may think you have a lot, you might only have a little. Then again, you may think you have a little, and you might have a lot. When I was a little boy, I was raised by my grandmother. And I don't know, when I was a little gaffer, she was probably 60, but as long as I can remember, Grandma would say, I'll soon be gone, dear, I'll soon be gone. Well, you know, we loved her. She was really an angel of God, but we thought she was never going to go. She lived to be 94 for 30-some years. I'll soon be gone. She didn't think she had much time left. She had 34 years left. Now, about the same time, I had a buddy of mine, Bob Yates. He was just 16. And bang, he ran into the abutment of a bridge and his life was snuffed out. If you had asked him a half hour before how much sand he had left, he would have said at least a half a century. He didn't have a half an hour. See, the trick is we don't know how much sand we have left. The future, we don't know. The past, it's gone. Now, the only thing you can deal with is what's right here, right now. And if you look, the sand is always moving. Now, think of this. You see, I was working on that, and then I was working on a graph I've got here on my computer, and I'm thinking of the time somebody said, hey, have you got a minute? Well, they don't really want a minute. Do you know if you're earning $50,000 a year in minutes, 42 cents? A half hour is... $12.50. If we take that ahead a bit, if you're earning $80,000 a year, a minute, 67 cents. Half hour is $20. If you're earning $150,000 a year, you got a minute? <laughs> it costs you $1.25 a minute. A half hour is $37.50. So do you see if somebody said, you want to stop for a cup of coffee? Well, if you're earning a quarter of a million dollars a year, a minute is two dollars and eight cents. Half hour is sixty-two dollars and fifty cents. And then, of course, you got the coffee to pay for on top of that. So you see, the point is this: this is all we've got right here, right now. We don't know how much we have left in the future, but we do know what we've got now. And I have found the people that win are the people who make up their mind. They're not going to waste the minutes. They're going to be productive. They're going to make it happen every minute. He said that success was the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Anyone that has a goal and they're moving towards it, they're successful. <clears throat> Most people think that you're successful if you have a lot of money. Quite often you have a lot of money if you're successful, but it isn't. I wouldn't say Mother Teresa has a lot of money. Okay. You know, but she's a pretty successful lady. So it's... Um, Okay, so that barrier to success... Well, there's a, there's a couple of them. Okay. I think there's two barriers. One is our conditioning. The conditioning that takes place in our subconscious mind from the time we're infants. All we can do is act and talk like the people around us. That's why we learn the language we learned. If there was ten languages spoken in our home, we'd learn ten languages without any trouble. Hmm. There's usually one, and that's the only one we ever learn. And we grow older and we think, well, I couldn't learn another language. We could learn a hundred if we wanted to. You can do anything. But I think we're conditioned. We have a, a real strong conditioning, usually with not some very good ideas. And then that, that's the, the, the barrier that's inside us. The one that's outside of us is our environment. We have a tendency to act like everybody around us. And if you think about this, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Because if you study statistics, 95% of the people live their entire life and never live the way they want to live. Did you know that 95% of the population in this country, let's say in North America, okay. the richest continent in the history of the world, they'll work productively, let's say for 40 of their 65 years, okay. and they'll end up with hardly any money. Well, there's got to be something wrong. 
So there's not much. Five percent of the people end up financially comfortable or independent. Are you trying to depress us, Bob? Because that's uh, no. Actually, <laughs> I think it's I think it's quite an exciting idea, because you see the idea behind it is that anybody can win, anyone at all. But if we start studying these statistics, I think we'll arrive at the conclusion: geez, I better start thinking for myself rather than follow everybody. Most people, they get a job, they look around, they see how everybody else is doing their work, and they start doing it the same way. Mm -hmm. They should stop and think, I wonder if any of these people know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, is there a better way to do it? But don't we have a need to fit in? I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to stand out. We don't want to get fired. We don't want to make waves. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Just fall into line, you know, take a number, be like everybody around. <laughs> you know, that'd be great in the animal kingdom. I, but human beings aren't supposed to live that way. I think we should make a few waves. We should maybe stand out, be different. Not not for the sake of being different, okay. but because we are different. We all think different thoughts. And I believe we should start to think and build images in our mind of what we'd like to do and then set out and do it. Okay, Emerson me... did that, Edison did that, Marconi did that, Samuel Morse did that, uh, Buckminster Fuller did that. We could go on and on and on. Okay. They were different, they stood out, they made a few waves. Select a person who is already doing something that you'd like to do. Get to know that person. Mm -hmm. Go to the experts for advice. Don't ask the person next door, your mother, father, brother, or the guy that works beside you, because they don't necessarily know. There's no point in asking a person how to earn a lot of money if they're only earning 10000 a year. They don't know. They knew they'd probably be earning a lot. It's like, don't fair. go to a sick doctor if you want to get healthy. Okay. So you find someone that you can go to for advice. Get a real good book and lock into that book and start to study it. Like. I've had this one that looks like a Bible, you know. But this is Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. I've been reading this thing now for 23 years. I'll probably read it for another 23 years. I get another good book that I brought over here today. It's called The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. Now, I'm not getting a commission for selling this. The author's dead now. He's been gone for a couple of years. But Dr. Joseph Murphy wrote this book, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. And that's probably one of the best books that you're ever going to find because you're going to learn something about your mind when you read this book. Okay. Now, I read a lot of books. I've got probably a thousand books sitting in my den at home in my library. But the one that I carry, I carry it everywhere I go and I read it all the time is Think and Grow Rich. I never stop reading it. Now, where's the value for you to reread that and read well, it again? I mean, you must, you must know it well enough that... Uh, I think I could probably recite it verbatim. But the secret is, I once read in a book where it said, when you read a good book through... Mm -hmm. the second time. You don't see something in it that you didn't see before. You see something in yourself that wasn't there before. You see, when I read this, I create a, a, a greater awareness. Do you know that the law of attraction is always working? It's like the law of gravity. If I let this go, it's going to go down. It's never going to go back up. It's going to go down. That is the law of gravity. Anything heavier than Earth is attracted towards the center of the world. Well, the law of attraction is always working. Now, how does it work? Well, I use a diagram to explain the mind. Now, let this circle represent your mind. And let this little circle here represent your body. Now, I want you to think of this for a moment. Your body is a molecular structure. This is a mass of energy and a very high speed of vibration. If you looked at your body through a microscope, you'd see that energy dancing right before your eyes. And here's something that'll keep you thinking for the next 20 years. When you move out of it, the body does not stop moving. If you go to a funeral parlor and pick up the remains and look at it, you will see it moving. And if it wasn't moving, how would it ever change the dust? You move into your body and you will move up. And it's how you use your mind that's gonna dictate the vibration you're in. Now stay with me. You have an imaginary line right across here, and that separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind. Now, the subconscious mind has been programmed. When you were a little baby, this is the way it was. So just like this, subconscious mind wide open, and everything that was going on around it went right in there. And all the energy that went in there when you were just a little baby form something called a paradigm. Now a paradigm is information. It's a multitude of habits. You are the product of your environment, but prior to that you are the product of a genetic strain that goes back for generations. Now I'm going to say that the paradigm is X type energy. 
Now you've got the ability here on a conscious level to think. And you can think anything you want to think. And as you think, you build ideas. There's a power that's flowing into your consciousness. It never stops. It flows to and through you. You can actually photograph this power leaving you. It flows to and through you. Now, as it flows in, you will start thinking, and you'll probably think X-type thoughts. Therefore, you're going to be in an X-type vibration. And that will produce X-type results. Now, it's the results you want to change. And to change the results, you're going to have to change what you attract. You see, the thoughts that you think control the vibration that you're in. Vibration is nothing but an idea. It's a law of the universe. Everything vibrates, nothing rests. We live in an ocean of motion. And it's the thoughts that you're thinking that you impress upon your subconscious mind that control the vibration the body's in. And that dictates how you act, but it also dictates what you attract. You attract energy that's in harmony with you. You attract people that are in harmony with you. You see, everything operates on frequencies. There's an infinite number of frequencies, but you and I operate on a frequency just like a radio station does. And the only music you can attract is the music that is tuned into the vibration you're in. Now it's the paradigm that has been controlling the vibration. You can change your thinking, but that doesn't do anything. You gotta change the paradigm. And if you don't change the paradigm, nothing happens. Now, talking about paradigms is another subject. We'll do that at another time. But it's the thoughts that you think that control the vibration you're in and that dictates what you attract. So if you keep attracting what you don't want, understand this, it's the paradigm that's causing the problem. You can think a Y type thought, which is totally different than the X type conditioning. It isn't gonna go anywhere. Because when you go to get emotionally involved, and this is the emotional mind, when you go to get emotionally involved with that white type thought, the paradigm will kick it out. You know why? It's so uncomfortable. That's stepping out of the box. That's doing things different. And we don't like to do things different because it causes a lot of discomfort. But understand this, the paradigm and the thinking control the vibration you're in. And the vibration you're in is gonna dictate what you attract. People that are in a poverty consciousness will continue to attract lack and limitation. It has nothing to do with this, what's going on here. This is your educated mind and you could gather all kinds of information. Have you ever wondered why some people have such an educated mind? They have degrees coming right off the end of their business card, but it doesn't show up in their results. Why? Paradigm. The law of attraction. You've got to change this. You've got to change the vibration you're in and your whole world changes. Listen, in 1961, a man gave me this book and he said, do exactly what I tell you. He was giving me Y type ideas. It caused an enormous amount of discomfort, but I did exactly what he said. And you know something? My income went from 4,000 to 175,000 in a year and then I took it over a million. It took me nine and a half years to figure out what happened. This is what I'm showing you. Watch this over and over and over again. There's a number of lessons in here. And another lesson, I'm gonna show you how to change the paradigm. When you change the paradigm, the change in results is automatic. You know why? You start to attract something new, something different. And what we want to do is program in positive information and eliminate the negative. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. A law of attraction. You attract according to the vibration you're in. This thing we live in is a molecular structure. Your body is a mass of energy. Do you know if you put your body in front of an infrared television camera in a completely dark room, your whole being would be nothing but a glistening, radiating, gleaming form. Feeling is conscious awareness of the vibration we're in. When we don't feel good, we're in a negative vibration. You wanna feel good? Move into a positive vibration. Stop and think of what you're grateful for. But understand this, you will never attract to you wealth, happiness, health, until you get the paradigm and get you on that frequency. It's Bob Proctor and thank you. See, people don't resist change. People resist being changed. Mm, yes. That's right. We've got to change ourselves. We've got to build a new image, a picture in our mind. We've got to see ourselves the way we want to be. And then we have to live with it. 
that's you go to the gym workout that's what you do you build a picture of how you want to see this arm, this arm, and you build that picture, and then you build the body. Well, you build the life in your mind. Take your pen and write out how you want to live, and always start by writing, I'm so happy and grateful, now that. And the second you write it, you've got it intellectually. The moment you impress it upon your emotional mind, you've got it emotionally. And it's only a period of time till it manifests on the physical plane. Yeah. Spirit works from a higher to a lower potential. Habits. Good habits will give you results that stick. Bad habits will destroy everything. I have some bad habits. That's right. All my habits are not great. So if you've got some bad habits, don't feel bad. So does your next door neighbor. So does your mentor, your coach. So does your mother and father if they're alive. So does everyone. And the trick of life is to replace a bad habit with a good habit. I used to hang around bars all the time. And one day I went in, I picked up a glass, and I looked around, and I thought, they're all bums in here. And then it dawned on me, I'm always here. <laughs> I learned something. I put the glass down, and I said, I'm never coming back here again, and I'm never going to drink this, and I never did. That was a long time ago. But you know what I did? I went from spending all my money in the bar to the racetrack, and I started to bet it all on horses. So I went from making somebody with a bar get wealthy, and then I started to feed the horses. And one day I woke up and I learned something. If you don't consciously and deliberately replace a bad habit with a good habit, you will automatically create another bad habit. Now what is a habit? A habit is an idea that has been planted in the garden of your subconscious mind and then repetitively fed for a sufficient period of time that you act on it without giving any thought to it. I'll give you an example. I want you to right now, mentally, imagine you're pulling on your underwear in the morning. What foot do you put in first? I put my right foot in. If I tried to put my left foot in my underwear first, I'd stagger and I'd fall over. You may say, what's this got to do with it? It's got everything to do with it. Why do I put my right foot? You may put your left. Certainly a lot of people do. Well, when I was just a little gaffer, didn't have a clue of how to put underwear on, my mother or my grandmother or my father or somebody came along and they had the underwear read, put your foot in here. Your other foot. What did they do? They had the underwear prepared as if they were going to put it on. And so pretty soon I was doing it like they were doing it. They, through repetition, planted the idea in my hand, in my mind. Well, now think of this. You don't just form habits of how to get dressed. You form habits to do everything that you do. And some of them are not that productive. Any idea that you keep dwelling on and impressing upon your subconscious mind becomes fixed in the subconscious mind. A habit is nothing but an idea that's fixed in the subconscious mind that you act on without giving any conscious thought. Many years ago, I went in to train the Prudential Insurance Company of America, their agents. I ended up training all of their agents. And I only got them to do two things. This is in the early 70s. I got them to form the habit of being in front of a prospect before 9 a.m. and ask everybody they talk to to purchase $100,000 worth of insurance. I said, you don't have to sell them. Just give them the opportunity to say no. Do you know the sales in that company went up by hundreds of millions of dollars? I had a, retire, a retired VP tell me he thought it was a billion. Just changing two habits. What habit do you want to change? I'm forever checking out habits I've got. I'm in the habit right now of changing my diet. And you know something? I've been doing it for going on three weeks. It's getting easier, but it's still not that easy. I still like to reach over and eat some of that when nobody's looking. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. I'm looking. What habit are you going to form? And you shouldn't try and form more than two at once. It'll become too big and too heavy and you won't form any. Make up your mind you're going to do it every day, every day, every day, until you don't have to think about it, and then you'll automatically do it. I guarantee you this idea will change your life. Think about it all day, because that is definitely an idea that will give you results that will stick. I'm going to share some information with you that it could change the direction of your life like night and day. And when I say that, I want you to really stop and take a look at your life. 
Um, take an honest look at your life. I, I was thinking just before I start to make this, we have actually been conditioned to kid with ourselves, to lie to ourselves, to um, not really take an honest look at the results we're getting. I want you to take a real honest look at your results. And when you look at them, ask yourself, am I living the way I really want to live? You see, most people aren't. One of the first questions I ask a person that comes to work with me, I want to know what's the most they've ever earned in a year. Now, I really don't care what the answer is, but I want to know what the answer is. Because you see, if, um, if a person says the most they've ever earned in a year is $50,000, I know where their mind is programmed. Um, if they tell me the most they've ever earned is $250,000, I know where they're programmed. And then I want to find out what they want. And I know then what has to shift because their mind is programmed and if they're really going to live the way they want to live, they, uh, they've got to change the program. And if they don't change the program, then nothing really happens. Talk about people paying themselves. They pay everything under the sun, but they don't pay themselves. Think of when you're on a plane and... Um, the oxygen mask may drop down. There's a problem with oxygen in the plane. They will tell you, if you have a child with you, put your own on first. Because you can't look after the kids if you haven't got yourself looked after. Well, that's exactly the same with money. Look after yourself first. If you don't pay yourself, you're soon going to cheat yourself and just not do very well. We are building a picture in our mind here. This is an idea. We could say it's a goal. Then we impress that idea upon this part of our personality. That's the idea in our mind. Now, what we've got to understand is that this part of our mind, the subject of mind, is actually universal intelligence. And this is really the way it is. When you press the idea upon your subconscious mind, you are universally everywhere. Now to help you think of that, where well, here's a phone. Let's suppose you're in, uh, okay, Buenos Aires. And I'm right here in uh, North America, Toronto. And I dial your number. I've got you on the phone. Time and space means nothing because I've got on to that frequency. And so you and I can communicate. We're connected. One person's in Buenos Aires, or you could say Singapore, you could say Shanghai, and another one is in New York or in Toronto, but they're connected. Why? The time and space means nothing because you're dealing with energy and you're dealing with laws. Now, when you impress this idea upon the subconscious mind, the subconscious mind is universal intelligence. And everything, anywhere in the universe, that's in harmony, that is a frequency. Understand that. That idea is a frequency. It's operating on a frequency. And so everything that's in harmony with it begins to move toward it. Because in harmonious vibration, you attract it. Now, throw a slide up, Scott. Look here for a moment. Soren Kierkegaard wrote something really great on intuition. He said, listen, you got to listen. You listen with your emotions. We can only get in touch with our 
own source of intuition and wisdom. When we no longer depend upon others' opinions for our sense of identity or worth. We all tend to worship something. The question is, will we worship the God of opinion or the God of our heart? I found I had less and less to say until finally I became silent and began to listen. I discovered in the silence the voice of God. Now look it. You're going to attract to you everything that you require to manifest the idea in your mind. Thoughts will come to you. It's your intuition that picks them up and then act on them. And just because you've never gone there before, you've never done it before, that's okay. This is where courage comes in. This is where awareness and wisdom comes in. See, intuition is the mental faculty. It, go back to our slide here for a moment, Scott. Intuition is here in our conscious mind. It's one of our intellectual factors. We have perception, the will, reason, imagination, memory, and intuition right here. Now, intuition is that mental faculty on a conscious level. We pick up thoughts that are flying our way. They're flying our way. What are they? It's energy that's in harmony with you. You've got on the frequency of this good that you desire. And you're going to start attracting. And that's what Kierkegaard said. We've got to start listening. We listen with our emotions. Let's pay attention to what's coming our way. I didn't like the idea that when you've lived for so long, you've got to cut out, you've got to stop. I thought, hell, I don't like that idea at all. And first of all, I think we're, we're I believe we're here to do God's work. God's work is creation, you know, mm -hmm. uh, expansion, fuller expression, greater goodness. Um, and if we're going to do that, we're going to be working at it all the time we're here on this planet. We never stop. So age should have no bearing on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a couple asking, of people asking, ask me when we started to build this place, we, we put a couple of million dollars into this, and somebody said, how old are you? <laughs> and I think I was probably 83 when they started to break ground. They said, you're 83, and you're going to spend $2 million building a studio? And I said, yeah, like, why not? I mean, you see, we let things that really have no concern, we let them bother us. We let them control us. Mm. Age is a dumb thing to let control you. It's our thinking that controls everything. That's the one point every great leader agreed on. We become what we think about. Well, what's a person thinking? I'm thinking if I get old, I got to stop. Well, then you'll stop. Mm. Or I'm thinking, well... If I've been here a long time, I've got a lot of experience. I want to utilize that experience to keep me going as long as I am here. There's a boss and there's a leader. Leader get people excited about improving the quality of whatever it is, themselves, their work, whatever they're doing. People follow leaders because they want to. People don't follow leaders because they have to. That becomes a form of dictatorship. Yeah. And that never works. The great leaders, people want to follow. And leaders inspire you. Leaders pull the very best out of you. Leaders know how to look inside and bring the best of you to the surface, cause you to look at the higher side of your own personality. What the world always is looking for, it's leader. Like it, it's silly to ask who's going to lead. The leader's going to lead. <laughs> right. And the leader just automatically emerges. If they threw 50 of us into a committee and say, you don't elect a leader, you may elect one, but the leader's going to lead and it probably isn't the one that's elected. Yeah, so true. And the everybody leader knows how, they know how to get the best out of people. I want to talk to you about where you're going and what you want to do with your life. You see, most people never go after what they want. 
because they don't know every step they have to take to get there. I want you to think of a person going up the side of a wall of ice. Now, the only rule for reaching a goal that you have to know is knowing where you're going and knowing that you're going to get there. You do not have to know how you're going to get there. Now, pay attention to this for a moment. Imagine the climber has all his equipment. He's got his crampons, he's got his climbing rope, his hardware, his ice axes. How does he get to the top? He's standing on the ground and he's looking at maybe a hundred foot vertical wall of ice. He looks up and he has absolutely no idea the path that he's going to take. He just sees himself at the top. He reaches up and he puts one pick in and then another pick. Then he raises one foot and then the other. Now he's not standing on the ground any longer. He's suspended on the wall on a vertical wall of ice that goes up for a hundred feet. He adapts to the changes that is taking place in his environment. And then and only then does he see the next step. And he moves this pick, then this pick, then this foot, then this foot. Now that's how he gets to the top, a step at a time. And that's how you're going to get to your goal. You just have to know the first step to take. And when you take that step, you're going to find that your conditions, your circumstance and environment will change. Then you see how you have to make the next step. It's a matter of adapting all the time. You only have to know two things. You have to know where you're going and you have to know that you're going to get there. You've got to see it in your mind. Now, this is the beautiful scenario. This is what it's all about. Save that in your mind and think of it often. Think, every time you think of your goal and you're trying to figure out how you're going to do it, think of that vertical wall of ice. What's the next step? That's all you really have to know. One step at a time. And you'll get to wherever you're going. That's how Hillary got to the top of Mount Everest. Hello there and welcome. Do you know, almost everyone has a great idea and they're going to execute the great idea. I have all kinds of people come to me, I've got a great idea I'd like to share with you. What they do is they want me to execute their idea. Why don't they execute their idea? When you get a real good idea, you should act on it. People have ideas of starting a business. I've started a number of different businesses. Question is, where to start? You start where you are and you start with what you've got. That's all you need. When you start where you are and with what you've got and you bring your mind to focus on that idea, you will attract everything to you that you need. You are taught, seek ye first this kingdom in its righteousness and all these things will be given to us. See, when you learn to focus on something, you get on a frequency. And when you're on that frequency, you start to attract whatever you want. You may not have any money, you may not have the resources that you need to execute, to build it into something big. That doesn't matter. All the resources that you need to do anything you want to do is already here. But you've got to get in touch with them. You've got to get in harmony with them and boom, you'll rush them into your life. You'll attract the money, the people, the thoughts, the things, everything you need, you'll attract to you. So where do you start? You always start where you are and you start with what you've got. Don't be looking at what you don't have. Think of what you do have. Fall in love with your idea and get it rolling now. If you tell yourself a lie often enough, you're going to start to believe it. And way around 1900, William James said, believe and your belief will create the fact. It's got to be believed. You've got to believe it. And if there's no belief, it ain't going to happen. See, when you believe it, you're encased in the idea. You fuse with the idea. And that makes all kinds of things happen. When you believe it, there's no quitting. You never quit. It doesn't matter what happens. You don't quit. Quitting is never an option. I, the people that quit, they never really bought into the idea in the first place. See, you've got to, you, you get it on three levels. The second you think of something, you've got it intellectually. When you get emotionally involved, you've got it on a spiritual or emotional level. Well, then that expresses itself through the body. Body's just an instrument of your mind. 
And so when you're really buying into it, you literally fuse with it. Neville said you fuse with it. And this causes all kinds of things to happen. You're dealing with electronics. You're dealing with energy. Like the second you think something, that's all you need. See, you live on frequencies. You think on frequencies. Your phone operates on frequencies. And it's like magic. Um, you're, you're in Romania, are you? Right. I'm in Toronto. Yes. If I've got your number on my phone, I could take a picture of something, hit it like that. You've got it in Romania. Simultaneous with me sending it. Because when you get into the mind, there isn't any time or space. It's just immediate. Yeah. Well, the, you're living on frequencies. Now, when you think of something, what you've done is you've flipped your brain onto a higher frequency. The very fact you can see it is all the proof you need to know you could get it. What you have to do is raise your love, love consciousness to that frequency. And then you will attract whatever's on that frequency. All the good you need to manifest the idea. Overcoming fear is one of the greatest moves a person can make. First of all, we have to ask yourself what causes fear. Fear is caused by ignorance, not knowing. And if we're going to go and do anything new, if we're going to break out of a paradigm, if we're going to change habit patterns, we're wandering into an area we've never been. And you know, fear stops most people. You'll find people afraid to talk to a stranger. You'll find individuals afraid to stand up and ask a question in front of other people. You'll find salespeople afraid to make a sales call, afraid to ask for the order. Stop and think of how confining that is. A person is putting themselves into a small cell, but it's in their own mind. The doors aren't locked. They can open and you can walk away to freedom. If you learn to overcome fear. When you face fear, it leaves you. Face the thing you fear and it'll leave you. That's really the secret of it. In fact, if you hold yourself back because of fear, your life actually comes to a stop because nothing gets better than it is. You've got to be courageous. Now, courageous people aren't without fear. Courageous people are the ones that face their fear. I think Eddie Rickenbacker pointed that out, the great pilot. Don't let fear stop you. Make up your mind you're going to step out and do it. Stop and think of the number of people that are in jobs that they don't like and they're afraid to leave or people in relationships that are destructive and they're afraid to leave. This is a terrible way to live and it's not necessary. It's just caused by ignorance. And when we step out and do something, we gain an awareness. We develop an understanding. And like that, the fear is gone. Make up your mind that fear is not going to stop you from doing the thing you really want to do. Step out and do it today. When I was 26, I had a man that sat down with me and he said, why don't you change the way you're living? It never entered my mind that I could. And looking back and thinking about it, I think there's all kinds of people wandering the planet. There's all kinds of athletes that are not getting the results they want and they don't know they can change them. Right, only one person can change. There's them. only one person in the whole universe that can change Bob and that's Bob. Yeah. There's only one person can change Dave and that's Dave. Now we get inspired by other people, we get help from other people, but we've got to do it ourselves. And he gave me Think and Grow Rich and he said, if you do exactly what I tell you, you can give anything you want. Well, I didn't believe that, but he was so adamant about it, I believed he believed it. And so I started to listen to him. And I set a goal, I wanted some money. I wanted $25,000. <laughs> now this was in 1961, so it was more money than it is today, but I didn't even know anyone with $25,000. He said, listen, write it on a card, keep reading the book, keep doing what I tell you. So I started to hear people talking about earning money, and uh, there was one guy who said, there's good money cleaning floors. You should, you should clean floors. Well, I wasn't proud, I'd clean floors. And he said, but you should do it for yourself, not for somebody else. So he told me where I could buy a used floor machine, some buckets and mops, but I had to borrow $1,000. <laughs> well, I was at the point where nobody wanted to touch me with money. And I often say, I wouldn't have lent it to me right. because I wouldn't pay it back. Not that I didn't want to, I just couldn't. But I found a guy and he lent me the $1,000. 
When you I'm, when you borrow, excuse me, because yeah. I have a question because I know you. When you borrowed that, that thousand because you owed people money already, mm -hmm. you had explained that to mm -hmm. people. You know, you were just finding yourself. But did you have a different feeling about when you borrowed this thousand that quite possibly you were actually going to be able to, to to pay this back this time? Do you know something? If I hadn't had that feeling, I wouldn't have got the money. I got it from a guy I knew his name, Al Kuiper. He was running, and I didn't know him. He had a trust company. It was like a bank on Danforth Avenue in Toronto. And I went in, I read a book where it says, go to one bank, the thing will give you, go to another one. Well, I ended up sitting in his office, and he said, what do you want this money for, son? And I told him I was going to build a cleaning company. It was going to be big. I had a dream. And I had to explain it all to him. He said, I think you'll do it. I'm going to lend you the money. Faith. But I knew when I was doing this, I had a picture, I had a dream, you see? Yep. And within a year, I was earning $175,000 a year. I had my billing up to $15,000 a month working for myself. In less than five years, we were working in Toronto, Montreal, Boston, Cleveland, Atlanta, and London, England. I had my own company off opening offices all over the place. Why most people don't get what they want out of life? Is it- Well, they don't know what they want. That's right. You see, I got this, and then I got Earl Nightingale's condensed narration of this on a long playing record. And I'd listen to that record over and over and over again. One day, I was in the business, in the cleaning business, I had salespeople, and I had them listen to this record. Every morning we listened to this record. And one day I said, you know, I'd love to meet him. And I didn't know who Earl Nightingale was. He was a voice on a record. That was it. I didn't even know where he lived. And a young guy that worked with me, he said, no, you wouldn't. He said, if you wanted to meet him, you'd go and meet him. I thought, damn, he's right. So I phoned, and I got an appointment with him. Now, at the time, he was the most listened to man in the history of the broadcasting industry. He was a radio broadcaster. And... Not an easy guy to get to, but I got to meet with him for an hour. I flew to Chicago, I spent an hour with him, and when I was leaving, I said, Earl, what's the big deal, you know? I mean, what's it all about? He said, there's no big deal. He said, it's, it's very simple. He says, simply decide what you love to do and then dedicate your life to it. He said, the problem with most people, they don't know what they love to do. They never take the time to sit and ask themselves. What they're doing is, Trying to, I think I can get earn good money here. I could do a good, you know. It's where can they earn some money? It's not what they love to do. Well, I was sitting there. Now, I had offices all over the place. I had a lot of people. I was earning a lot of money. And I, I got excited because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I want to do what he was doing. And I made up my mind sitting in his office. That would be somewhere around 1965, that I was going to go back and I was going to work with him. And in 1968, I moved to Chicago. I left my own company. I moved to Chicago and I started to work with him. We hear patience is a virtue. I suppose it probably is. But I think patience, real patience, is an expression of deep understanding. You see, everything happens when it's supposed to happen. Everything in this universe happens by law. We set targets and we need things to happen. We need something to come or someone to do something. And frequently we get frustrated because it isn't happening when we think it should happen. Our problem is we're not thinking. We believe we're in charge. We are not in charge. We are in charge of building the idea and holding the idea. Everything else happens automatic. It happens by law. All ideas have a gestation or an incubation period. I'm told when we plant a carrot in the area of the world that I live, it takes approximately 70 days for that carrot to grow and manifest in form. When the seed for the baby's planted, it takes approximately 280 days. And we're usually patient. We will wait the 280 days. Why? Because we know it's going to take approximately 280 days. Well, 
Just because we don't know how long it's going to take doesn't mean that it isn't operating by the same laws. Everything operates by law. So if we gain an understanding that all the ideas in our mind will ultimately move into form, that's what Andrew Carnegie taught Napoleon Hill. Carnegie was Hill's mentor. He said, any idea that's held in the mind, that's emphasized, that's either feared or revered, will begin at once to clothe itself in the most convenient and appropriate form available. You might want to listen to that two or three times. Burn it into your mind. Gain an understanding of it. And you will know that whatever you're working on takes a period of time. No one knows what the gestation period is for an idea. We only know we can shorten it through concentration, through focus. And when you understand that, you will become more patient. And when you're more patient, you're living in a much more beautiful vibration. You'll be a more pleasant person to be around. You will enjoy yourself more. Patience. It's the result of understanding. If you really analyze your beliefs, you'll change them. I had a friend one time, I, I was trying to figure out where do beliefs come from? How do you, because all religion and all science will tell you, you gotta believe it. William James from Harvard, 1900, he said, believe in your belief will create the fact. So belief is an interesting word, you gotta believe it. And um, I was having lunch with a mentor one time and he said, our belief system is based upon our evaluation of something. Frequently, if we reevaluate a situation, our belief about that situation will change. It was like bells were going off my head because I was trying to understand belief. How do you change your belief? Well, he told me, it's through reevaluation. And so I started to evaluate myself and reevaluate what I was doing. It took me nine and a half years, but I figured out why I changed. And it was the repetition of information. Thank you. You're in, you're in sports, you yep. know. It's repetition. Yep. Repetition, repetition. Well, but practice doesn't make you perfect. Perfect practice makes you perfect. There's a big difference. Great point. And so I found that the part of our mind that controls our behavior is not the part of our mind that gathers information. School deals with the part of your mind that gathers information. And so we gather all kinds of information, and if we can remember it, they give us a test, we pass the test, we get the degree, and we're educated. That's not education at all. That is gathering information. Education, as Hill pointed out, comes from the Latin educo, meaning to reduce, to develop, or to draw from within. We have genius in us. We have absolute perfection in us. And what we have to do is learn how to tap into that, to let it out. But we have a part of our mind that controls our behavior, and that's where a paradigm is. And the paradigm literally controls our behavior. I don't care what you're doing. If you're not altering the paradigm, you're not gonna improve your results. There's so much about ourselves we never learn. The part of our mind that controls us is our intellect, or our subconscious, where the paradigm is, but we're trained to live through our senses. We're trained to go by what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch. And we've got to understand that we've got this genius within us, and if we will consciously gain an awareness, an understanding of how to alter the paradigm that's controlling our behavior, when we learn that, we can start to improve life, just like that. And there's no end to what we're capable of doing. We're conditioned genetically. All mom's DNA and all dad's DNA becomes our DNA. There's two particles of energy come together, that's the moment of conception. 280 days later, we make our debut on the planet, then we're programmed by our environment because our subconscious mind, which is totally deductive, it has no ability to reject, the subconscious mind is immoral. It's like the earth. It doesn't care what you plant, but it'll return what you plant. Right. Earl Nightingale used a beautiful example in The Strangest Secret. He said, you can plant nightshade, a deadly poison, not a sixteenth of an inch away. You can plant corn, a sweet food. One will grow with just as great an abundance as the other. And that's the way your subjective mind works. You put the wrong idea in, it will grow. Put the right idea in, it will grow. We have the ability to change what's in there. We did not program it. It was programmed through genetic history. We're the uh, confluence of a genetic pool that goes back for generations. That's at birth, and then environmentally. And we have the ability to alter all that. See, any success I've had, I've had because I've got great mentors. And I'm a good student. 
Now, until I was 26, I was a terrible student. When I picked up this book, I become a great student. I've got thousands of books. I have an office at home in my home that's got a couple of thousand books in it, and then I built a studio, and I've got a couple of thousand books in the studio. And I love reading. But the success that I've enjoyed is because of the mentors or the coaches I've had. I would do exactly what they tell me. And if I coach somebody today and they don't do exactly what I tell them, I don't coach them anymore. Just like that, it's all over. It's not ready. Well, they're not, they're, it's not that only that they're not ready, but if I'm going to coach somebody and they're not doing what I tell them, I'm wasting my time and, and theirs too. Now, if they want to waste their time, that's their prerogative. I'm not going to waste mine. You know, forgiving is one of the most freeing concepts anybody can ever get involved with. Most people look at forgiveness as helping the other person. Somebody hurts you, somebody does you wrong, but you're going to forgive them. You're going to be kind to them. It has nothing to do with the other person. It has to do with yourself. That's really what it has to do. See, forgiveness is a cleansing concept. It's clearing the mind of all negativity, clearing the mind of anything that might go wrong. It's a very freeing concept. If you were to do some harm to me, and I forgive you, you haven't got anything to do with it. It's I'm letting go of something that was bothering me that's negative, and I don't want to hold on to that. Forgiving frees the one that's doing the forgiving. It's a phenomenal concept. Forgive means to let go of completely, abandon, let it go. Don't hold on to it. You know, if somebody does you wrong, you have to ask yourself, ask yourself wonder why they would do that. There's something bothering them. They're not really trying to hurt you. It's something that's bothering them. Let it go. Just forgive it. Forgive the idea. And I guarantee you, you'll feel a lot better. One of the greatest hang-ups that people have is the belief in themselves. They, they suffer from something called self-doubt. Many years ago, I read something. Um, it was by um, Ralph Waldo Emerson. It was his essay on self-reliance. That's what we want to do. We want to rely on self. And in that, he said, there would come a time in every person's education when they'd realize that envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. So many people look at someone that's doing very well, possibly in the same field they're in, and envy them. Do you know what that's saying? That's saying, I don't know that I have the same mental faculties you've got, I'm drawing on the same potential that you're drawing on, there is only one mind, I don't know that, so I'm going to envy you thinking you can do something I'm not able to do. The truth is, if you can do it, I can do it. Envy is ignorance, it's not knowing that. And he said, imitation is suicide. Do you know that nothing in this universe would move in the precise order it moves in your absence? That's true. Everything in the universe is essential. You take any part away from anything, it's not complete. And everything in the universe moves in a very precise way. So do you see, we shouldn't even want to be like anybody else because we are unique. We are truly unique. There's something like about us that you'll never find in another person. We're unique. And we've got the godlike ability to think. Now, what is self-doubt? Self-doubt is the opposite of self-confidence. Confidence comes from understanding. Like I would imagine you're confident you can drive your car. In fact, you're so confident that you'll be talking to somebody on the phone, you'll get in the car, you'll start the car, you'll drive, and you'll drive maybe four or five blocks, not even be aware of what you've done. It's all done automatic. Your concentration is on the conversation you're on. Now, when you first got in a car, you couldn't do that. The car was probably jumping all over the place and you thought you'd never learn how to drive it, but you learned how to drive it, now you're quite confident. You're confident that you can get dressed when you get up in the morning. When you were a little boy or a little girl, you couldn't do that. You had to be taught to do it. Well, do you know, self-confidence comes, like all confidence, it comes with knowledge. And the more you study you, the more you understand who you are, the more confident you'll become in your ability to do whatever it is you're doing.
and you'll know that if you lack confidence in an area, it's because you lacked information in that area. Never doubt yourself. And when you do, understand that the cause of that doubt is not lying within you, it's in wrong thinking, it's in not understanding who you are. Study yourself. Self-study will develop self-confidence and self-confidence eliminates self-doubt. Love is the greatest thing. Love what you do. I went to visit Earl Nightingale one time way back in the 60s. I'll never forget it. And I was leaving. I felt I was so grateful I had an hour of his time. And I said, Earl, what's the real secret? I mean, what's the big deal? Well, he said, there isn't any big deal, Bob. And there isn't any secret. It's simply a matter of sitting down and determining what you really love to do and then make a decision to dedicate your life to it. Man, did I get excited. He said, the problem with most people is they don't know what to do and they never make a decision to dedicate their life to anything. I got so jazzed. I knew exactly what I would love doing. I would love to do what he was doing. I made up my mind I wanted to do it and I wanted to do it with him. And I made up my mind I would make a commitment to that for the rest of my life. You know something? That's exactly what I've done. I love what I'm doing. I love it. I absolutely love it. Now, when you love doing something, you'll run, baby, and you won't get weary. You'll walk and you won't get tired. You know why? You're a free flow. The energy is just freely flowing through you. You are greatest instrument then that God's got. You're here to do God's work. What's God's work? God's work is creation. God's the creator. You're creating God's image. You've been given creative faculties. Fall in love with what you do and you'll be creating great stuff wherever you go. Love what you do. Love the people that you're working with. Fall in love with the idea of love. At a very early age, we put a cap on awareness and then we say, now it's all about the intellect. And so we've got lessons in school and you've got to remember what's in the book and if you pass the test, you get the degree. There's all kinds of people walking out of schools with degrees, they're going crazy by degrees and yet they can't find work, they're broke. You got people that have a doctorate in economics and they're broke. How could that happen? Because they don't know how to use the information they've gathered. The average individual is self-serving. They're, they're, they're always focused on themselves. I want you to just pay conscious attention today. Write a little note maybe that you fold up and carry in your hand. Why do you do that? Just to remind you that you want to pay attention to everybody you meet. What are they doing? Are they really trying to help other people or are they really trying to find help for themselves? Are they self-serving or are they serving others? You're gonna find the people that are the best at serving others. They are the big winners in life. Figure out how you can improve the service you're rendering. Now, I'm probably a little older than you, so I've been running around the park for a, quite a bit longer than you. And I have learned one thing really well in life, that my success, my happiness is going to be dependent on how good I get at serving you or serving other people. I spend most of my time trying to figure out how to help other people. I do. I don't spend much time. You know, I get almost everything I want. Almost everything I want. There's very few things. I can't even think of anything I want. Christmas, birthday comes along. Oh, well, I don't know. I, you know, send a donation in my name. I, like, I don't want anything. And it's got to a point where I just want to serve others. So all I want to do is serve others. Now, I'm a pretty happy guy, pretty healthy guy, pretty wealthy guy. What have I done? I have just learned how to fall in love with the idea of serving other people. Our company's success is going to be dependent upon how many people we can serve and how well we serve them. We have a phenomenal staff of people in Proctor Gallagher Institute. I choose to believe that we have, I, I, just, I just love our staff. We have some of the most phenomenal people and we've got people coming, like we have a guy, Tommy Collier. The guy is a creative genius. He came, he wanted to come to work with us. I said, you want to work with us? I thought, wow, guy's so good. You will attract good people if that's all you want to do. Just serve other people. That's what we do. 
and we've got everybody in the company. That's where they're going. We got some pretty happy people, very successful people. And all we did is focus on serving other people. Companies that are enjoying the most success, they're the ones that provide the most and best service. This is the way it works. It always has worked that way. And I'm inclined to believe that it always will work that way. Fall in love with the idea of serving others. You'll be very happy, but you'll also be very successful. You should seek failures. See, if you're playing it safe, you're not going to win. If you're playing it safe, like that old saying, you know, you were taught when you are a little girl, better to be safe than sorry. Well, that's a bunch of crap. It's not better to be safe than sorry. It's by trying things that you figure out how far you can go. You got to get outside the box. Like it's reported, Edison tried 3,000 ways before he built the incandescent light. He, he said he didn't fail 3,000 times. He said there was 3,000 different steps to building a light bulb. Well, there's different steps to get to where you're going. And I really do treat winning and losing exactly the same. I do not let it upset me. Do you think that's a big part of why you're so successful? Well, it's part of why I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think it is, because I'll try anything. Like, if, if I'm into an idea, the idea of losing never enters my mind. See, I have worked with giants. I had the good fortune of working with Sir Edmund Hillary. He was the first man to stand on top of the world. And I worked with him on three different occasions. And the only difference in Ed Hillary and Bob Proctor is in his, his size. Now, he's gone now, but he was a big man. When he shook hands with me, his hand wrapped right around mine. I felt like a dwarf, you know. And in talking to him, like it never entered his mind, he wouldn't get to the top of the mountain, but he failed in 1951, he failed in 1952. It wasn't until 1953 that he got to the top of the mountain. Now, people had died for centuries trying to do that. But he said, I knew if I could see it in here, I could hold it out here. Stella Mann wrote that in a book. If you can see it in your head, you can hold it in your hand. And that's right. And if you're not prepared to lose, you're never going to win, because you're always playing it safe. And there's no, there's no reward in that. Look at these two men. Do you know who they are? Most people don't. They're just a couple of ordinary guys. One, they're both gone now, but one was an ordinary beekeeper in Auckland, New Zealand, and the other a Sherpa guide from over around Nepal. Now, there's Mount Everest. Do you know for thousands of years, people had tried to get to the top of Mount Everest. People died doing it. It was believed it couldn't be done. People tried, but they didn't know how, and so they quit. There's a closer look at the mountain and where they placed their flag. They planted that flag in the mountain. Now, this is the two of them after they come down the mountain. And you know something? When they started, they did not know how. They didn't know how to get to the top of the mountain. And that's what stops most people, because they don't know how. As little kids, we'd go, Mommy, Daddy, I want this. And they say, now, how are you going to do that? Well, as a little kid, you don't know how to do it. But they did it. In 1953, on the 29th of May, they were the first two to get to the top of that mountain. They stood right on top of the world. Do you know there's been over a thousand people do it since then? I watched a young woman on Canadian television being interviewed, not very big. She had just come back from going to the top of Mount Everest. And the reporter asked her, they said, how does it feel now that you conquered the mountain? She said, we didn't conquer the mountain. That mountain can't be conquered. We conquered the limitations that are within ourselves. J.C. Penney, when he was 92, somebody asked him, how are you doing? Well, he said, my eyesight is fading me. But he said, my vision has never been better. <laughs> Van Gogh one time was asked, how do you do such beautiful work? He said, I dream my painting, and then I paint my dream. Vision, vision. Where there is no vision, the people will perish. What is vision? Vision is a long range view of a multiplicity of things you want to do. Now your purpose is why you're living. Your vision then, you want everything to be on purpose. Your vision then is like a funnel coming out of your head, going off out into the future. It's a long range picture 
of a multiplicity of things you want to do. Your goal is taking a bite out of your vision. So sit and think. I'm God's highest form of creation. I've got mental faculties that go beyond the scope of my imagination. And build a long range vision of all the magnificent things you want to do. Live with a vision. If you're not doing that now, you're missing something in life that's very valuable. Stop whatever you're doing right now and totally relax and build a vision of doing all kinds of things in the future. Future, They all blend in together, but they're all different and your life just gets getting bigger and better and bigger and better and bigger and better. That's the vision of your life. Vision, it's a beautiful picture. It's like a movie in your mind, a vision. You build the vision with your imagination, not with your eyes, but with your imagination. See, a person hasn't got this, where there is no vision, the people will perish. It's so true, so true. Build a vision. I quoted Andrew Carnegie a few minutes ago. He said, any idea that's held in the mind, that's emphasized, that's either feared or revered, begins at once to clothe itself in the most convenient and appropriate form available. Depression comes, it starts out from ignorance, doubt, and worry. I've got a chart, I show it. Doubt and worry is on the negative side of life. Understanding is on the positive side. Right. Don't worry comes from ignorance. Understanding comes from knowledge, but you got to study to get it. Doubt and worry are a psychic disease. It's an intellectual exercise. They're using their intellectual factors to build a negative idea, and that's all they see. They take and internalize that, and they get emotionally involved with it. It goes from don't worry to fear. They've emotionalized the doubt or worry, turns into fear. The fear is in the emotional mind, and the emotion must be expressed through the only instrument that can be expressed through the physical body. So it moves the body into a state we call anxiety. Hmm. Anxiety is never expressed. Anxiety is suppressed. Don't know the suppression happened. turns to depression. Mm -hmm. They ball it up inside. They suppressed the fear. It turns into depression. The depression turns into disease. The disease turns into decay. St. Clair Lewis was right. He said, we don't die, we kill ourselves. Now, what is the opposite of all that? You go from ignorance to doubt and worry to fear to anxiety, suppression, depression, disease, disintegration. Go over on the other side. You go from understanding to emotional state called faith. You just know it's going to move into form because you understand the law. Faith isn't believing something you can't see. Strange thing about faith and fear, they both demand you believe something you can't see. Why would people choose fear over faith? Because they're ignorant. So you go from understanding to faith. The faith manifests on the physical plane, not as anxiety, as well-being. The well-being is not suppressed, it's expressed. And the expression turns to acceleration, you're building energy. And that is because there's no disease, you're at ease. And that turns into creation, not disintegration. It's all, it's all a mental trip that they're building. I'm going now they go to the doctor, the doctor gives them Valium or some kind of drug to cool them out. He gets them numb so they don't know what the hell they're doing. Have you ever thought of failing your way to success? Think about that for a moment. Do you know that anyone that enjoys any kind of success feels their way there? That's right, they do. I want you to think of this for a moment. See this little light here? Someone gave me this as a gift. This is a replica of the light that uh, Edison built. And you know, he spent a long time before he got this thing to glow. He really did. And He started off because he had an image of it in his mind. But every time he tried, he failed. And he failed 3,000 times, it's been said. Now, I've never really talked to Edison, so I don't know if that's accurate, 
but I have an idea it is. 3,000 failures. Now, a reporter asked him one time how he felt about failing 3,000 times. He said, I didn't fail 3,000 times. He's there with 3,000 steps to get to where I'm going. Do you know, if I were to tell you all the sad stories about, it's gotten me to where I am, I would really spoil your week. And there's been some real sad stories. I think it might even make me cry again. But I've had so many failures that I wouldn't even want to guess at it. I have, I've blown everything I had three different times. I never let it bother me much. And you know, I have found that every time I failed, I moved closer to the goal. You see, if you knew how to do it now, you'd be going sideways. When you're going after a goal, you're going ahead. And because you're going where you've never been, you're going to make mistakes. You don't know it all. You have perfection within you, and the objective of life is to bring that perfection to the surface. That's exactly what this guy did. Well, you're going to make a lot of mistakes bringing that to the surface. Those mistakes are steps to where you're going. I often tell salespeople that are afraid to make a call just to get out there and make a call. And their objective isn't to sell, their objective is just make the call. If you make the call and you're afraid and you do it, you're successful. You've accomplished what you want to do. You made a call. And after you get comfortable making those calls, then you can start to polish up your presentation and odds are pretty good, you'll start making sales. And if you keep polishing up your presentation and working at getting better, you're going to master a thing called selling. But if you think that you're going to enjoy great success and it's just one win after another, you're kidding yourself. It just doesn't happen. I don't even know anyone that's pulled that kind of a deal off. If they did, they were cheating or lying. You don't get what you want. You get what you are. You've got to become what you want. You've got to realize that the minute you hold your mind in harmony with the good you want, then you've already got it. It's only a period of time till it manifests in physical form. You've got it intellectually, and you can talk to somebody about it. You've got it emotionally, you can share your feelings. It's only a period of time till it moves into form. That's called the perpetual transmutation of energy. That is a law, the first law of the universe. Do you have any regrets for your life? No, absolutely not. I'll tell you. I probably would have said yes 15, 20 years ago. Then what happened? I was watching Johnny Carson's show, hmm. The Late Show, and Johnny Carson wasn't there. George Carlin, the comedian, was sitting in for him. And they're both dead now. Vincent Price, a movie actor, was a guest. He's gone too. But Vincent Price had just shot a pilot. And of course, they told the public on television it's a new series. Well, it wasn't a new series at all. They were hoping it would turn into a new series. They shot a pilot, and if they got good ratings, then they'd shoot a dozen more of them. Right. And so after they went through the small talk, Carlin says to him, well, tell me, Vince, Vincent, tell me about our new, your new series. And Vince says, oh, I think everybody's going to love it. He said, it's about a train, and it's like a magic train. Is you can buy a ticket to go back in your life. Hmm. I would pay for that. At any point, you want to start over. And he said, when you get there, I'm the conductor on the train. I stop the train, and I let you off. And he said, I think everybody would like to go back and start over at some point. Don't you think so? I thought, yeah, I could think of a couple of things where I could have started over. And George Carlin said, no, I don't think so. He said, if I went back and changed anything that had happened in my life, I wouldn't be me. And I like me. And I thought, God, what a perfect answer. No regrets. Everything that happened was necessary to make me who I am, to prepare me to do what I'm going to do. And you see, the crazy part about it, none of us know what we're going to do. We think we know. 
Right. We got a track, but things happen. The barrier to success. Well, there's a, there's a couple of them. Okay. I think there's two barriers. One is our conditioning, the conditioning that takes place in our subconscious mind from the time we're infants. All we can do is act and talk like the people around us. That's why we learn the language we learned. If there was 10 languages spoken in our home, we'd learn 10 languages without any trouble. Hmm. There's usually one, and that's the only one we ever learn. And we grow older and we think, oh, I couldn't learn another language. We could learn 100 if we wanted to. You can do anything. But I think we're conditioned. We have a, a real strong conditioning, usually with not some very good ideas. And then that, that's the, the, the barrier that's inside us, the one that's outside of us is our environment. We have a tendency to act like everybody around us. And if you think about this, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Because if you study statistics, 95% of the people live their entire life and never live the way they want to live. Did you know that 95% of the population in this country, let's say in North America, okay. the richest continent in the history of the world, they'll work productively, let's say for 40 of their 65 years, okay. and they'll end up with hardly any money. Well, there's got to be something wrong. You know, Don Shula, the coach of the old my Miami Dolphins, he said it's the start that stops most people. And he's right. It is the start that stops most people. They're always going to get ready to get set to get going. What we've got to do is, boom, just like that, move into action. See, if you don't get started, you're never going to get finished. How do we do that? Start early. I believe when you wake up, you should get up. The second you wake up, get your feet hit the floor, move into action. And you know, you'd be wise if you sit down at night before you go to bed and write down six goal achieving activities. Now that isn't go to the store, or go to the bank or get to cleaning, it's not that. These are goal achieving activities. Write down six of them. And when you wake up in the morning, you move into action. You know where you're gonna go. You don't even have to think about it. Step into action and get on the first one. When you get it done, forget it and go to the second one. Don't think about the first one, focus on two. Don't even think about three. When you get two done, go to three. But knock them off one at a time. If you don't get them all done, just move them over on to the next day. Now that doesn't mean if you only get three done that you have nine the next day. There are three of the six that you're gonna do the next day. Six goal achieving activities. And when you wake up in the morning, move into action on them. Quit holding yourself back. Don't wait. You say, well, I really don't know how I'm going to get started and the way will show itself. It just appears. I have found when you get started, when you move into action, everything starts to happen around you. I have worked all over the world. I mean, all right. over Asia, China, South America, North America, Europe. And I'm always asking people, what do you really want? And I have found most people don't want to be really wealthy. What they do want is they don't want to have any financial concerns. If they want to buy a new suit, they can go and get one. If they want to take a trip, they can take the trip. If they um, want a new car, they can get the new car. They don't want to just run out and spend or buy. They don't want to have any financial concerns. Two, they want to wake up in the morning excited about how they're going to spend their day. Oof. And the third, they want to mix with people who are upbeat and uh, creatively productive. These are the three things that people really want. So in answer to your question, if somebody's watching, what's the first thing they should do? Well, the first thing they should do is understand why we have goals, not just to set a goal, because most people don't set goals right. They, they're operating with a limited level of consciousness, so they're thinking, hmm, if I could get a little more money, and if I could get him to help me and her to help me and this happened, then I could do this. Maybe this is get a new car. What we've got to understand is we're trading our life for our goals. Literally trading our life. Would you trade your life for a car or a house? I don't think so. So it's got to be something really meaningful. And we're not taught to think this way. We should sit down and don't give any thought to where the money's gonna come from, where the help's gonna come from. 
It's what do you really want? Like Ed Hillary was a beekeeper in Auckland. That story. He wanted to climb Mount Everest. It had never been done. People died trying to do it. He went in 51 and failed. He went back in 52 and failed. In 1953, he stood on top of the mountain with Tenzing Norgay. But he didn't know how to get there until after he had got there. Edison didn't know how to illuminate the world until after he had done it. The Wright brothers were bicycle mechanics in Dayton, Ohio. No one believed you could fly. They had been trying it for years. But they saw it. But they wanted to do it. They didn't know how, and they couldn't tell you until after they had done it. Now, the first flight only lasted 12 seconds. And the naysayers said, yeah, but they only were up there for 12 seconds. They said, we not only got up there, we kept the damn thing up there for 12 seconds. So when a person sets a goal, they've got to say, what could I want? If I just let my mind rock, just wander, use my imagination, how do I really want to live? That's what they should be doing. Most people don't use their imagination constructively. Most people use their imagination destructively. They imagine what they don't want. We've got to consciously and deliberately imagine what we do want. If we will take and sit down with a pen and ask ourselves, what do I really want? What do I really want? And write it down. And then make a written description of it in the present tense. Writing causes thinking. Thinking creates an image. And you get these images going, you're building a vision in your mind. It's the visionaries that's changed the world. Think of that. The fact that I can sit and look into this camera and you can sit and look at me on your phone or on your TV or on your laptop. That was the result of somebody's vision. Do you know everything you've got, the clothes you wear, the house you live in, this microphone that's in front of me, it was all the result of somebody's vision. It's not an accident. You and I have a marvelous imagination. And everything starts with a vision. Van Gogh was asked how he did such beautiful work. He said, first I dream my painting, and then I paint my dream. Many years ago, I read a book by Terry Cole Whitaker. It was a classic. What you think of me is none of my business. Think of the amount of time that is wasted on negative energy wondering what other people think of you. What they think of you really doesn't make any difference. It's what you think of you that makes a difference. So as you go through the day, don't worry about what other people think of you. Just say, I'm all right. I'm God's highest form of creation. See this line? That's called the terror barrier. Yeah, jumping at you, isn't it? And on the other side of the terror barrier is something we call freedom. And you know, very few people get through that terror barrier. It's rather sad. Freedom is available to everyone. There isn't anyone that cannot live the way they want to live. See? Why don't they? Why don't they? They don't know. And they don't even know they don't know. Now, I'm going to show you why people experience buyer's remorse when they buy something they really want, and then they back away, where they go to move and they don't. They go to change jobs and they don't. They go to move to another city and they don't. Why? Fear causes them to stay where they are. There's the individual. The X represents the unknown factor, the paradigm. Now, there's a power flowing into this individual's mind, and they can make anything out of it they want. Remember we said we had the ability to choose? What do they choose? They choose thoughts that are in harmony with the paradigm. Now, here's an important point. The paradigm controls the vibration of this thing we call our body. Our body is a molecular instrument. That's really what it is. It's a mass of molecules and a very high speed of vibration. The vibration that the body's in, on a conscious level, we call feeling. 
When a person says they feel this way or they feel that way, what they're really doing is describing the vibration they're in. Now, they choose thoughts that harmonize with the vibration they're in so they feel comfortable. They may not like the results, but they're comfortable. Now, let's move ahead. Let's take a look here. Those people are getting X-type results and they don't like it. Do you know what the problem with them? They're in bondage. These people are locked up. Do you know, paradigm is like keeping a person in a prison. Only there's no locks on the door. They can open the prison and walk out into freedom anytime they want. And they don't. They keep getting the same results over and over and over again. They're in bondage. Now, let's go ahead. Here's the same person. X-type conditioning, X-type vibration. The power's flowing into them. And for some strange reason, from left field, ba-boom, in comes a Y-type idea. What is a Y-type idea? The Y-type idea represents anything that you might want to do that you're not doing. It might be moved to another city, change jobs, sell the house, buy the farm, whatever it may be. Ask the little girl for the date. Ask the guy to go to lunch. Go make the sale. Buy what you want. Go where you want to go. That's the why idea. But as long as the why idea is just in the conscious mind, it's just going to be an intellectual exercise. It's never going to happen. So how do we make it happen? Well, that's when everything goes haywire. Here we are here. Same person. Okay? The power flows in. And what do they do? They got the Y type idea. Now, for some strange reason, they know that they've got to get emotionally involved if they're going to act on that idea. They don't understand what's going to happen. But clearly understand this. Your central nervous system is the most complex electrical system in the universe. The central nervous system is mind-boggling. It would make the electrical system in a supercomputer look like a toy. Now, the second you take the idea from your intellect and impress it upon the subject of mind, that's when all hell breaks loose. Because the body moves in to an XY vibration. It's not in the X vibration. Not the one that we're comfortable with. May not like the results, but we're comfortable. No, on a conscious level, everything's going crazy. On a conscious level, we experience doubt. The doubt turns into an emotion called fear, and that fear is expressed through the body as anxiety. See, that person is getting emotionally involved to move ahead. Do you know what happens? They hit that terror barrier and they bounce off it and right back into bondage. And they're so relieved to get back there. They're back where they're comfortable. They've canceled the sale. They've decided not to move. They're going to stay in the job that they don't like. At least they're comfortable. Now, that's not a very good way to live. And you know something? That's something everybody experiences if they're going to grow. You're going to hit that terror barrier. See, the terror barrier is going beyond where you're at, going to a new level. I'm going to tell you something. When I set a goal, if, if, if it doesn't scare and excite me at the same time, I know I'm going in the wrong direction. Now, I also understand that my paradigm is going to try and get me to bounce back to where I was. It doesn't want me to move ahead. I don't want to live there. I lived there for the first 26 years of my life. And for the last 50, I've had a phenomenal life. And it just keeps getting better. And I want you to do the same thing. Understand what I've just said. I'm going to back this up. They got emotionally involved in the why idea. That moved their body into a different vibration. On a conscious level, they're experiencing some crazy stuff. They start to doubt their ability and they'll never be able to pay for it. They, they experience fear. The fear expresses itself as anxiety. And bang, you bounce off that terror barrier and you're right back. Oh, I might not be earning much here, but I know what it is. Uh, I, I would love to move there, but I'm comfortable here. I think I'll just stay here. These people are acting like they have a contract to live forever. And they don't. Do you know what to do? Say, I'm going to get rid of all that. I understand it's there, but I don't want any part of it. And I'm going to go crashing right through that terror barrier. Now, does that get rid of the X energy? No. The X energy is still there. You see? But at least you're over into freedom. You made the move. You did it. 
And if you continue to feed the right information into your mind, keep feeding that why idea, keep getting emotionally involved in the why idea, you're there, you're on the road. Keep doing that, you're going to find that the paradigm is going to change and it'll just all go away. And you know where you're living? In freedom. You're living where you want to live. Buyer's remorse is when you cancel the sale. Buyer's remorse is when you stop just before you buy what you really want. Before you go for the thing that's going to change your life and you know it. It's not moving to the other city. It's not starting the business of your dreams. It's not stepping out and betting on yourself. That's a terror barrier that's causing that. And if you don't learn to go through the terror barrier, I'm going to tell you something, you're going to stay right where you are for the rest of your days. That's not a good place to be. What did Joseph Campbell say? So true. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Many years ago, I read where Napoleon Hill pointed out that the imagination is the most marvelous, miraculous, inconceivably powerful force that the world has ever known. And you know, the average individual uses the imagination, if they use it at all, against themselves. They imagine what they don't want. They imagine problems coming. Let's begin to use our imagination the way God meant it to be used. It's the greatest creative faculty that we possess and we can build anything we want with it. I want you to wander around your home or possibly your office and take a look at all of the conveniences that you have there that you didn't have, let's say, two years, five years, 10 years ago, 25 years ago. Do you know that every one of them, without exception, was first created in the mind of one individual with their imagination? Do you know you can use your imagination to go into the future and bring it into the present? That's what all highly successful people do. They see where they want to go, and then they act like the person they want to become. It was William James from Harvard's advice. He says it's the actor's technique. Act like the person you want to become. How do you do that? Well, you use your imagination, of course. You see, it's a strange phenomenon, but the greatest gift we've got is used very well up to the ages of four or possibly five. The little child, we always wonder what's going on in their mind. They're using their imagination, they're building wonderful pictures in their mind. But then they get to school and wham, like that, it comes to an abrupt halt. It's called not paying attention, daydreaming. Well, what they were really doing was exercising a phenomenal mental faculty. You see, we can see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Therefore, our physical benefit, as long as we're living in a physical body and corresponding with the material world, we will use our sensory factors. But you know, I have a couple of little dogs at home that can hear, see, smell, taste, and touch. We've got higher faculties. You have perception, the will, memory, intuition, reason, and imagination. These marvelous tools. We can take our imagination and build an image in our mind of how we want to live. Block out what's going now. Don't let your present results have anything to do with this. Just what you want. And it's with your imagination that you will build it. Everything that we have, the camera that I'm speaking to right now, was first created in the mind of one individual. Think of how our world's changed. You see, we were gifted with these higher faculties. We're God's highest form of creation. We were created in God's image. We were given creative faculties to use. 
And you know, they're only used by two or three percent of the population. It's almost inconceivable that we, people would wander around with so much power and potential and squander it. See, the average person literally tiptoes through life, hoping they make it safely to death. It's such a shame, and it doesn't have to be that way. I think we have giant corporations and little wee creative departments. And the primary reason for that is the average individual really does not believe that they're creative. Now think, everyone's creative and no one is more creative than another. It's just that some have chosen to use their creative faculties to a greater degree than others. Imagination, your imagination, what do you want? How do you really want to live? Build the picture in your mind. There's a power that is flowing to and through you. A creative, unadulterated power. It can be photographed leaving your body. Way back in the 30s, Semyon Curley and the Russian photographer perfected a form of photography where you can actually photograph a person's body and you will see the energy glowing from them. Well, that energy flows into your mind and it's the images you build in your mind that's going to dictate the vibration that this instrument you're living in is in. And the vibration on a conscious level is called feeling. Make certain that you exercise your imagination daily. Build beautiful images in your mind of how you want to live and then hold those pictures there and live that way. The imagination, the greatest nation in the world, the imagination. You've got one. It's a marvelous creative tool. It deals with the invisible side of your personality. You see, no one will ever really see you. They'll only see your body, and they'll see you the great work that you do. Make certain that your work is great work. And if you keep your imagination alive, keep it active, you're going to have a phenomenal life. But you know, life can get better every day, and it will get better every day. Through the proper use of your imagination. What a wonderful idea. This is Bob Proctor. Thank you. Dr. Maxwell Maltz wrote a book back around 1960. It was called Self-Image Psychology, Psycho-Cybernetics. It's a phenomenal book. He said it was the greatest discovery of his generation. He was a cosmetic or a reconstructive surgeon, and he found he would do work on people. He might have done a nose job or removed a terrible scar. And he noticed that when he did that, there was a phenomenal change in their personality. But he noticed with others, he would make a phenomenal physical change and there was no change in their personality. And that led him to postulate that we have two images. We have the one that's coming back from the mirror, but we've got an inner image. And that inner self image is literally controlling our life. You will find people that have a very poor self image or low self esteem. They won't look you straight in the eye. They're afraid to shake hands with you. They're very shy and withdrawn. They go through life hiding from life. They don't like themselves. They don't know themselves. Do you know when a person improves their self-image, they change their entire life. Their income change, their relationship change, their health changes. And do you know how you do that? Start studying you. Start to find out more about you. There's something phenomenal about you. Do you know, when I began to study this material 57 years ago, I had very poor self-image. I had low self-esteem. I took dumb jobs. I never earned any money. I never had fun. I had poor relationships. And as I started to study, started to study real solid information, everything in my life started to improve. I've got friends all over the world today. I earn millions of dollars. I'm in my 80s and I get as much energy as a person in their 30s. Do you see, when you start to understand really who you are, 
You're God's highest form of creation. There's things about you that just about blow your mind as you start to study and really understand them. You'll walk a little taller. You'll stand a little straighter. And you know something? You'll enjoy a whole lot more of life. You've got to wake up. You see, all we're ever going to get is awareness. We've already got everything. The only thing we lack is the awareness of what we've got. We're God's highest form of creation. There's nothing on the planet that will equal us. Well, that's all, we're, that's all any of us are after. That's all the problems in the world come from ignorance. That's God. the purpose of life, to overcome ignorance, develop awareness. The only way to overcome er ignorance is through knowledge. And the only way to get the knowledge is to study. Most people, they finish school, close the books, say, I got that's over, I'm never going to open another book as long as I live. <laughs> They're screwed, it's all over. Napoleon Hill, in Think and Grow Rich, wrote an entire chapter on decision. Most people never make decisions. They have a difficult time with it. Why is that? I think they have a difficult time because their parents made decisions for them until they were too old. And they never learned how to make them. Do you know, the one thing that I did with my kids, I never made a decision for them. They didn't like it. They'd say, come on, don't do that to me. And I said, no, what do you think you should do? And I'd leave it at that. Decision making is a phenomenal concept. And you're going to find out, as he points out in here, that successful people make decisions very fast and they change them very slow if and when they change them at all. And he said the people that have difficulty in life make their decisions very slow and then change them fast and often. And you know, decision making is a funny thing. You and I think on frequencies. If we could see a bunch of lines and we're thinking on a frequency and we're on this frequency here and we say, I'm going to do that when this changes. This is never going to change until you get up on this frequency. See, the good that you're after is on a higher frequency than you're operating on, a greater awareness. And if you're down here and you're thinking here on this frequency and the good you want up here, you got to get your mind up there. How do you get up there? Make the decision, be there. And that's really what you have to do. The second you make a decision, you flip your brain onto a different frequency and you start to attract things to you that you couldn't, you'd never get without making the decision. See, someone woke me up. That's all I want to do with someone else. What the man said to me, the first guy, he said, you can have whatever you want. Well, you know, they, good you offer. get thinking, that can, you can get out of the box. That's why you've been given an imagination, to get out of the box. It's with your imagination that you build images of what you want. And if you can build the image, you can do it. You can hold it in your head, you can hold it in your hand. When we understand that, like I would imagine this goes out to a lot of athletes, doesn't yep. it? Well, they can, they can have anything they want. They gotta pay the price. And when doubt comes in, kick it out. You yes. can't afford the doubt. If I want to do something, I find somebody that's already done it. And then I do exactly what they tell me. Hmm. It's a simple rule to follow. I, um, I don't read novels. I don't watch movies. Um, I'd watch documentaries or things like that where I can learn. Uh, I'm only interested in studying something that can cause me to become more of what I'm capable of being. Um, see, I think we're all hardwired to do something really special with our life. And that's all I want to do. Hmm. I'm really good at what I do. I could walk by a person in the hall and like that, I could tell them exactly what they're like. I could read their energy like a book. Everything goes on the inside, shows on the outside. See, we're, we're gifted with, with faculties of the mind that the average person knows nothing about. You have intuition, the will, reason, imagination, perception, memory. That's what separates us from all the rest of forms of life. We go through school and never learn anything about it. Like you'll hear people say they have a bad memory. There's no such thing as a bad memory. Everybody has a perfect memory. It's just weak. They've never developed it. Our imagination. Your imagination is the most magnificent. He's, Hill said it's the most marvelous, miraculous, inconceivably powerful force the world's ever known. 
I can use my imagination to project myself into the future and bring the future into the present and start living there. You work from the imagination. You don't work to it. You work from it. Backwards from the result. Yeah. You know, the people you surround yourself with have had a phenomenal impact on your life. I think it was Carl Menninger from the Menninger Foundation one time said, environment is more important than heredity. The people we're surrounded by have a greater bearing on our life and our success in life than what's built into the genes at birth. There's genetic conditioning, there's environmental conditioning. Well, this environmental conditioning goes on all the way through life. You will find as you improve the quality of your life, improve your thinking, you're going to attract a different group of people into your life and they are going to add to your life. See, the people we're surrounded by, their thinking is going right into our mind. We want to mix with people who are really making it happen. Take a look at your five people that you're with most often and ask yourself, if I have children, would I want them to grow up be like them? If the answer is no, you better start looking for some new friends. If the answer is yes, you're already in the right circle of people. Think about what I'm saying. The people we're surrounded with have a phenomenal impact on our life and help make us who we are. William James from Harvard said, believe and your belief will create the fact. All things are possible if you believe. Well, you know, I studied for a long time. I started to study this book, Think and Grow Rich. And he talks about belief in here. He says, you're not ready for what you want until you believe you can get it. I found that the only two sources of reference we could go to to find out anything about ourselves is science and religion. They all say you've got to believe. So I kept figuring out, how do you, how do you believe? How do you change a belief? Interesting subject. Because I'm going to tell you something. Your results are nothing but the manifestation of your belief system. Well, our belief system, now listen carefully, is based upon our evaluation of something. And frequently when we reevaluate a situation, our belief about that situation will change. Let me repeat that. Our belief system is based upon our evaluation of something. Frequently, if we reevaluate a situation, our belief about it will change. I began reevaluating who I was. I started to study. I never stopped studying. And I found as I reevaluated, I had a much higher opinion of myself. I found out things about me that I would have never believed if you had told me. The power that's locked up within us, the marvelous system we've got. Do you know the blood circulates through your veins every 33 seconds, through hundreds of miles of passageway, bang, just like that, colors all the food in and all the garbage out. Stop and think of the central nervous system. It's the most complex electrical system in the world. And you've got it. Think of your brain, an electronic switching station like that. You can change the vibration of yourself and everything around you. We have awesome powers. And it's all based on what you believe about you. Sandy Gallagher is my business partner. Love her. She is really good. She was going through a very tough time personally a number of years ago. We were in Phoenix, we were doing a seminar. I had to leave, catch a plane somewhere. And she said, before you leave, could we get together maybe for a cup of coffee? Could you, um, I want to talk to you. And I said, sure. So we went across the road to a coffee shop and we were sitting there and she said, could you give me two or three ideas that I could do every day that would help me through this? I said, sure. I didn't know what I was going to tell her, but I knew I would tell her something. So I said, every day, I want you to take a pen and write down, every morning, write down 10 things you're grateful for. Ten th but you've really got to be grateful. You've got to feel it. You're really grateful. Then I want you to send love to three people that are bothering you. If they're bothering you, you don't like them. They've got nothing to do with it. You're thinking bad thoughts about them, you're putting yourself in a bad vibration. Send love to three people that bother you. And then take five minutes and be quiet. Just be perfectly quiet and ask for guidance for the day. 
Everybody in our company does that every day. She started to do it like that, everything changed. In fact, my assistant, Gina, who's been with me over 30 years, she was working in Phoenix and I phoned Gina and I told her what I wanted. Within an hour, she had a pad printed at Kinko's and had it, the 10 things, from one down to 10, you know. I send love to three people who would bother you be quiet for five minutes. Sandy was going to Hawaii with her sister and her mother the next day. She got pads made for both of them. And every morning they started to do that. It changed every one of their lives. We give that out now in a lot of our seminars and we train the audience to do it. Start every morning, write 10 things that you're grateful for. Send love to three people who bother you. Be quiet for five minutes and ask for guidance for the day. It's a winning form. You see, the beautiful truth is, you've already got everything you need inside. You don't have to get it. You don't have to follow the pattern that our formal educational institutions teach us. You don't have to read all the books. That's not necessary. I think Madame Montessori put it very well. She said, we tend to send a child to school as if they're an empty cup and we expect them to fill the cup. She said, the truth is the cup's already full. School is to help draw out what's already there. You see, you and I are God's highest form of creation. There's nothing on the planet that will even come close to us. Strange thing to know, you and I are the only creature on the planet that is totally disoriented in our environment. All those other little creatures, they're completely at home in their environment. They blend in. We don't. We're totally disoriented. And that is because we have the ability, you and I do, of creating our own environment. Now think of what that means. That means that you and I can literally create the life we want. Now, as I said, when I first heard that, I did not believe it. But I knew the man that was giving me the advice believed it. And that man was Raymond Douglas Stanford, one of my very first mentors. Have you ever spent any time wondering, how does everything happen? How does everything happen? Why does the night follow the day? Why doesn't the day follow the day? In fact, in some places it does. But I spend a lot of time thinking about this. In fact, at times it almost drives me crazy. But like right outside of my studio here is a Japanese maple tree. And there's times of the year it's absolutely beautiful. In the spring of the year, it has buds on it, and then the buds boom, and leaves pop out. And the leaves generally in the spring are a very deep greeny brown. They're not a pretty looking leaf. But then they start to change, and over time, you don't notice it happening, just one day you look and it's a different color. And by fall, the leaves are crimson red. They're the most beautiful. It is the most beautiful tree, and it's right outside in my studio. I'm sitting here at my desk and the camera's around me, but out there is that tree. And you know, every fall the leaves turn red. Every spring they're greeny brown. They're not greeny brown in the fall and red in the spring. They're always red in the fall and greeny brown in the spring. Think about it. Did you ever wonder why the tide goes way out and the tide comes way back in? I spent some time in the Navy in Canada and I was down on the East Coast for a while and I was near the Bay of Fundy. Do you know the Bay of Fundy has one of the highest and lowest tides in the world? It's absolutely amazing. It goes way out and then comes way back in. Same up around Prince George on the West Coast. You go onto a ship and you might be walking up a plank just right straight up and you go off the ship, sometimes you're going right down. That ship goes way up in the air and it comes way down. Very high, very low tide. Now some places the tide's not very big. They do have a tide, but not too high, not too low. Why is it so different in one place than another? You know, why does the leaves change color? Why do they change color? You know, why does the grass keep growing? Wouldn't it be so much nicer if the grass just, you know, just stayed at a certain length, you wouldn't have to cut it, but it would always look pretty, you know? 
Do you ever think about this? Do you know that everything in this universe happens in an exact way? An exact way. Not by chance, but in an exact way. When John Kennedy, the President of the United States, acted, asked Dr. Werner von Braun, who was the mastermind behind the space program, he asked him, what would it take to build a rocket that would carry a person to the moon and bring him back safely to Earth? Von Braun answered him in five words, the will to do it. That's it, the will to do it. He knew he didn't have to know how to do it. He knew he had to learn how to do it, but he didn't have to know to make up your mind you were going to do it. Now, why did he say that? Because he understands the laws. Von Braun one time said after years of studying the spectacular mysteries of the cosmos, he was led into a firm belief in the existence of God. And he said, the natural laws of this universe are so precise that we don't even have any difficulty building spaceship. We can send people to the moon and we can time the landing with the precision of a fraction of a second. Now he said these laws must have been set by someone. I see the laws as God's modus operandi. But I'm going to tell you something. Everything happens by law. When you and I get in harmony with the law, now we do that, laws are pretty good, we should understand them. But when we get in harmony with the law, then I'm going to tell you it's just smooth sailing. Success happens. Probably be a good understand, good idea to understand the laws, wouldn't it? Think about it. Your life is governed by laws that are not man-made, so they're not going to be man-changed. And if you study them and work in harmony with them, I'm going to go shock yourself with the good you can do. Now, I've been doing that for the last 58 years. I'm starting to get a really, a reasonable grip on them, but I don't understand them as well as I want to or would like to. But I'm going to study a little more today. You know, I get my trusty book out here. I'll have to talk to you about this book. Uh, that'll be another talk. Study the laws. Find out what they write, what they're like. What are the laws? And then study them. You'll win. You ever notice that some people seem to want to hang on to stuff that is bothering them? They're forever talking about it. They don't want to let it go. They've had a, a, a failure at something and it's grown. They can't get over it. They just can't get over it. Or somebody said something nasty to them. They don't want to let it go. Do you know what we should do? We should ask ourselves, everything that happens, is this serving me? Is this serving me? And if it's not serving you, get rid of it. You don't want anything in your life that's not serving you, that's not causing you to grow, that's not adding to the quality of your life. I don't care what it is. You will find some people, they just hold on to bad stuff. They hold on to problems. They don't want to seem to let it go. And that adds more problems. Whatever you focus on grows. The only thing that can grow is the thing you give energy to. Why would you hold on to anything that's not serving you? Now, I want you to think about this. I'm not going to talk about a lot about this today because I don't think I have to. I just want to let you know that if you're holding on to something that does not serve you, you are making a terrible error. It's going to cause all kinds of problems. You may blame other people or other things. You may blame the situation. Uh-uh. It's you are the cause of the problem. The man that told me to pick up this book and read it, Ray Stanford, he had a saying. He used to say to me, Bob, you're the only problem you'll ever have, and you're the only solution. I think it might have taken me five years to understand that. But I do understand it. And you know something? I am the only problem I'll ever have, and I am the only solution. Don't hold on to anything that is not serving you. Reject it. Do you know the beautiful part about having an inductive reasoning factor? That's the part that chooses thoughts. You can accept or reject. The beautiful part of your mind, you can accept or reject anything that comes into your world. Accept or reject it. It's a choice. Don't hold on to anything that is not serving you. Right now, I'm standing in the middle of my library. This is my favorite place. Do you know, Earl Nightingale said, if you surround your mind with greatness, some of it's going to rub off. Well, hopefully, some of it has rubbed off on me. I have maybe three or 4,000 books here on the shelf. They're all in alphabetical order uh, by author. They're all cataloged. 
So I know where to find something just like that. I go by authors more than the title of the book. Do you know that when I started studying these books, I really didn't know very much about anything. I had two months high school. I was 26 years old. I had a bad work record, a bad attitude, and, and virtually no experience. And you know, in a relatively short period of time, my income went from 4000 to 175000 a year. Then it went over a million. I like, there's a saying on all of your seminars, on the tickets, uh, if you have to borrow money for this, do it. It may be the last oh, time yeah. you're doing it. Listen, wow. when, I, when I read this, I owed everybody I knew money. But the guy that told me, he said, don't clean offices for somebody else, do them for yourself. And he told me where I could buy a used floor machine and some buckets and mops. It was gonna cost $980. I mean, I didn't know anyone would lend me money because I never paid them back. Not that I didn't want to, I just never had any money. Well, I searched and searched and searched and I found a guy that lent me $1,000. So when somebody tells me they can't borrow money, I know that they haven't tried. I think anybody can borrow $1,000 somewhere. And that's what I did. And I turned it into a multi-million dollar organization. I sat down one day with my pen in this business, I said, I'm going to build a company that operates all over the world. We operate all over the world. So if you have to borrow money, borrow the money. But get into the business. Actually do it. Although you cannot change conditions or circumstance, you don't have to let them control you. Mm. We can't control what's going on outside, but we can control what's going on inside. You know, and... Unfortunately, I don't think many of us have been raised to really understand that. Yeah. And it's a lack of understanding that's causing all our problems. We are the only creature on the planet that's totally disoriented in our environment. <laughs> all the little squirrels, the birds, the every, all the animals are completely at home in their environment. They blend in. Mm. You and I are totally disoriented in our environment. We've been given the mental faculties to create our own environment. However, we go right through school and we've never learned that. We have higher faculties and the average person has no knowledge of how to operate with them, how to develop them. We have perception, the will, reason, imagination, memory, and intuition. Now, those mental faculties, they're not just words, they're actually mental faculties that we can use to take control over our world and to create the environment that we want. But unfortunately, we grow up, we don't know that. We've been raised to live through by what we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch, our physical senses. And we're, we've been raised to be controlled by what's going on outside. As little kids, will you listen to what I'm telling you? Will you look at this? You know, and so it's all outside. Um, we get our report card, and that tells us what kind of student we are. But it really tells us where our mind was at for a few minutes three weeks ago. Mm. got nothing to do with who we are. Mm. So I think we're, we're raised in ignorance, actually. There's a very small percentage of the population that have a reasonably clear understanding of who they are and what they're capable of doing. But the ones that do are in the minority. The future must become the present in the imagination of the one who would wisely and consciously create circumstances. I think right now everybody wants to create circumstances because they don't like the ones they find themselves in. But you see, you cannot change the circumstance you find yourself in. You can only change your perception of them. And when you do that, you change the circumstance. So we say here, the future must become the present in the imagination of the one who would wisely and consciously create circumstance. We must translate vision into being. Thinking of into thinking from. Imagination must center itself in some state and then view the world from that state. See yourself where we want to be and then be there. Thinking from the end is an intense perception of the world of fulfilled desire. That is so cool. Thinking from the end 
is an intense perception of the world of fulfilled desire. So what are we doing? We're building a goal and then we see ourselves already having accomplished the goal. Thinking from the end is an intense perception of the world of fulfilled desire. Already got it. I don't have to get it, I've already got it. That's an intense perception of the world of fulfilled desire. In other words, you got it, it's here. Now think, are you thinking from the end or are you thinking of the end? If you're thinking of the end, you're thinking it's way out there. If you're thinking from the end, you're part of it. See, the end result has already happened in our mind. We're creative beings, we're God's highest form of creation. We can create in our consciousness the kind of person we want to be and then be that person. And that's what he said here. We must translate vision into being. So we don't just visualize it, we be it. I set a goal in 1973. I set a goal that I was going to build a company and upgrade all over the world. I had uh, left the Nightingale Kona Corporation and decided that I was going to do this because I didn't agree with the way they were doing it. People weren't really learning it fast enough. Uh, they wouldn't get involved in the repetition. We were selling recordings, but the recordings weren't working because the people didn't understand how to use them. So I decided I would leave and start my own company. And I wrote down I'd build a company and operate it all over the world. I got a call last night from Mikey about nine o'clock, something like that. And uh, she told me that we were now in every country in the world. Now think of that. We had a broadcast going on here at 10 o'clock this morning. Some of you would be familiar with it. Some of you may have been on it. And uh, that broadcast had attracted thousands, literally thousands of people from every country in the world. The goal was reached. That move meant this is really accurate today. We're only limited by weakness of attention and poverty of imagination. Well, my imagination was pretty well exercised. I don't have any difficulty building huge ideas in my mind and just figuring out how to do it. Now stay with me here. The thing that's stopping you from taking the risk that you want to take is called a terror barrier. The way I'm going to explain this to you, I come up with sitting in a restaurant. I remember it was at a Holiday Inn restaurant. It was at Dixie and uh, just south of the 401 Highway in Toronto. A man asked me if I would meet with him. He had a problem and um, I was going to show him how he could solve the problem. And he explained it. So I took a pen and some paper. And what I'm going to show you here is essentially what I showed him. Now, look at this for a moment. There is the process you go through when you're in a risk-taking vibration. You go from bondage to reason to the terror barrier and then to freedom. You go from bondage to reason to the terror barrier and then to freedom. You know, in Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, he said, now right here we come to a rather strange fact. We tend to minimize the things we can do, the goals we can accomplish, and for some equally strange reason, we think other people can accomplish things that we cannot. And he points out that there's a difference between wishing for a thing and being ready to receive them. He said, no one's ready for a thing until they believe that they can acquire it. The state of mind must be belief and not mere hope or wish. Now, he goes on to consciousness. He said, open-mindedness is essential to belief. Closed minds will not inspire faith, courage, or belief. I think reason is probably, <laughs> it's the one that's spoken about by almost all the great leaders. Yeah. Um, they've all been complete unanimous agreement that we become what we think about. It's our reasoning factor that enables us to think. Um, Ford says thinking is the hardest work there is, which is the probable reason so few people engage in it. Mm. Dr. Ken McFarland uh, who's gone for a long time now, but he was a great educator down in Kentucky. He one time said 2% of the people think, 3% think they think, and 95% would actually rather die than think. <laughs> now, you know, that sounds cute, but it's true. 
If you stop and listen to what most people are saying, it's going to be fairly obvious they're not thinking. Mm. If you stand back and watch what most people are doing, it's fairly obvious they're not thinking. Or they would never say or do what they're doing. Most people today have their television on the news and they're just soaking up all the stuff that's going on that's dominating the media right now. So they've become a plaything for what's going on outside. Mm. And that's why they're living in such fear. By consuming the media of whether it's true or accurate or not true, you're, you're being manipulated Absolutely. in a sense. Yeah. It's not a matter of whether it's true or not. Is this how you want to spend your life just listening to that? Mm. Um, that doesn't mean you should deny it. It doesn't mean that you should say, well, that's all false. Um, I don't know whether it's true or false. It's just bad news. I don't want to be involved in it. Yeah. Am I aware that it's there? Well, you'd almost have to be dead not to be aware <laughs> that it's there. But that doesn't mean you have to spend your time thinking on that. Mm. I would much rather yeah. activate some of my creative faculties and do something that's constructive. It's pretty well known today there's a lot of fear in the world. People are wondering what's going to happen. We've gone through many tough times, if you study history. I was born during the Great Depression. So I was of an age then, I remember some of the things as a little kid. Then we went into a world war. And when the Depression ended, it was sort of like a theater where the lights were out. It was empty, but the lights started to come up. And things started to get brighter. And of course, they became very bright. So the fear, don't let fear control you. Fear is a negative emotion. By following these principles, you're going to be on the other side of fear, where there's faith. There's a law of the universe called polarity. That law decrees everything has an opposite. Every negative has a positive. The truth is, it's neither positive or negative. It's our thinking that makes it so. Everything just is. We can make it what we want. Make up your mind now. You're gonna go in the positive polarity. You're gonna stay with me because that's where I'm going. And there'll be a very bright future. Let the fear go. It isn't necessary. The cause of it is ignorance. The cause of all fear is ignorance. If you want something you haven't got, you gotta create a space for it. And if it's in your own mind, you've gotta let go of something. So what do we want to do to let go of? We want to let go of the image we've got for the one we're going to build. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When I started to do this, um, I tested it just, I thought, I wonder if this really worked. And I found that it really worked. So I went all out. And you start out by writing the image that you want to hold. And I'll tell you how I did it. I, um, I took various people that I really admired and I took some of the qualities that I really admired in them and I'd write them down. I wasn't going to be like them, but I was going to develop a couple of these qualities or habits. When I was growing up, I was a young guy, it was during the Second World War, there was no men around, no fathers. But one guy did have a father, Donnie Miller's father had, was not well. So he couldn't go to the war. And um, Donnie's dad had a heart attack or he, something. It was, I think it was a heart attack. And so we never went around his place because his dad wanted things quiet. They'd come around our place, but not Donnie's place. I would watch Donnie's dad walk up and down the street. You'd see him go way up the street. Later on, you'd see him come back. He was always well-dressed, and he had the calmest walk. There was no rush, just a very calm walk. I visualized myself walking like him. You'll very rarely ever see me rushing anywhere. There's no need of it. You can be calm. So when I built my self-image, I built it around certain things. Ray Stanford always had money. I told you earlier, I don't know how to get into this thing now. Always have some money. Always. Now, 
I hardly ever use it because I really don't pay for very much. Um, I get somebody in the company to order whatever I want. But you see, I never had any money. Ray always had a roll on him. He would have a roll like that in his pocket all the time. Now, there's about $3,000 here. This is not about, there is $3,000 here. You see? Well, I only earned $4,000 a year at that time. $3,000 would have been a ton of money. But everybody has different little quirks. I like to carry money. I, and it's probably because I never had any. And now I have some money, I want to carry it. But you see, I started to do that before I had any money. And I would take, and I would put phony money in a roll, but I would have the right thing on the outside, it was the thickness of it. My mind didn't know the difference. I knew intellectually the difference, and then shortly I didn't even pay any difference to that. It was the feel of it. I did different things. I watched different people. I saw how this person did this and somebody else did that. I, um, I read a lot, so I read a lot of great self-help books. And I literally did what some of these books suggested. It wasn't just sometimes, I did it. I would follow it right to a T. Um, you'll very rarely see me without a suit on. That's part of the paradigm. That's part of the paradigm. I don't care what anybody else does, how they dress. I'm always going to be dressed. I um, mentally made up my mind one time, I'd be at least, if it wasn't the best dressed, one of the best dressed people in the room. Why did I do that? I did that because I was changing how I saw me. How I saw me. I had never gone to school. I had no money. I had dumb jobs. And today, along with Sandy Gallagher, I have a company that operates all over the world. Right here on my desk, I have sitting this little hourglass. Well, you know, I can't put anything where that hourglass is until I get rid of it. And we find that we want things to come into our life, but we don't create room for them. Nature abhors a vacuum. And I remember we were um, sitting in the living room having a cup of coffee and just visiting. And she said, do you mind if we go and sit in the kitchen? And I said, none at all. So. So I asked her, I said, why do you want to sit in the kitchen rather than here? She says, I can't stand that room. I just hate living in that, sitting in that room. She says, I hate those curtains that are on the window, in the dining room and the, the drapes on the front window. And I said, no, you don't hate those, Mark. I said, you only have tracked things to you that you love, that you're in harmony with. I said, if you really didn't love them, you'd get rid of them. But she said, I'm going to put, the, I'm going to put them there if I get rid of them. I said, Mark, if you had something to put there, you couldn't put it there because you've already got something there. And I said, that's when I started to teach her the law of vacuum law prosperity. So anyway, she went and got a chair and got up and stood on. She started to take all these curtains down. Well, Don, he was roaring like a stuffed pig. He said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm getting rid of these. And she did. It wasn't too long after I dropped in, all the furniture in the living room was gone. It was like they were just moving into the place. But then they got new curtains, and then they got new furniture. And you know, everything in that, business, in that house changed. It wasn't too long, they were only business for themselves. They're both gone now. But when they left, they were very well off. They had a beautiful place in Florida they'd go to in the winter. The family still runs their own business. I mean, it was, it was such a beautiful thing to see. And it was all, and I tell the story in here because it was all about the vacuum law prosperity. Well, what have you got in your life that you don't want or that you don't like? What is it that you've got that you really want to get rid of? You've got to get rid of this stuff. Get rid of it. Give it away. See, nature truly does abhor a vacuum. When you make space for the good that you desire, that's when the good's going to come. Most people don't make the space for the good that they desire. Do you know, the truth is your spiritual DNA is perfect. We hear a lot of talk about DNA today. Well, if you get past all the nonsense that's been programmed into our 
subconscious mind from genetics in an inner environment and get right down to the core of who you really are, your spiritual DNA is perfect. And it's that perfection that's seeking expression with and through us. That's why we want things. It doesn't matter what we're doing, we want more. Now, as a little boy, I was taught by my grandmother, who pretty well raised me, that you should be satisfied with what you've got. Grandma was a dear woman. She was like an angel of God, but she was wrong. We should never be satisfied with what we've got. We should be happy with what we've got, but never satisfied. You see, dissatisfaction is a creative state for our mind to move into. It causes us to want to do more. We should ask ourselves where those wants come from. Do you know it's that perfection within that keeps jabbing you in the consciousness? Want this, want that. If you're running, you want to run faster. If you're jumping, you want to jump higher. If you're selling, you want to sell more. If you're singing, you want to sing a better tune. It doesn't really matter what you're doing. You want to do it better. And the beautiful part of this is you can. I'm going to share something with you that could change the course of your life could make everything so much better. To do this, to explain it properly, I'm gonna tell you a little story. It goes way back 57 years. A man gave me this book. He said, Bob, do exactly what I tell you and you can have anything you want. Now, when he said that, I was flat broke. I had $6,000 in debt and I was only earning $4,000 a year. The prospects of things getting better were pretty slim. I had two months high school formal education. I had absolutely no business experience. I was not in a good spot. But he said, listen, there are all reasons why you can't win, Bob. He said, if you do what I tell you and study this book, is you're gonna figure out how you can. Now, this is Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. He spent his whole life studying 500 of the world's most successful individuals, and he found there was a golden thread running through their life, and that's what's in this book. I've never stopped reading it. I then found a condensed narration of the book by Earl Nightingale, where Earl took and he condensed the whole thing and he put it on a long playing record. And I would listen to that and listen to it and listen to it. In fact, I had started my own company and I used to play the records to the salespeople every morning. Well, one morning, it was very early, just finished the sales meeting, just finished playing Earl's record. And I said, at the end of the meeting, I said, man, I'd really love to meet him. One of the salespeople said, no, you wouldn't. I said, what do you mean I would? He said, if you really wanted to meet him, you'd go and meet him. And I thought, you know something, you're right. I got on the phone and I got an appointment with Earl Nightingale. Now that wasn't an easy thing to do. Earl was the most listened to man in the history of the broadcasting industry at the time. Earl Nightingale and Lloyd Coonan started the Nightingale Coonan Corporation who literally started the personal development business as we know it today in recorded fashion. He was considered the Dean of Personal Motivation. There was probably a couple of million people that would have loved to sat down with him but I got the appointment. At the end of the meeting, I had a wonderful time there. When I was leaving, I said, Earl, what is the big deal? I mean, what is the real secret of light to making things happen? Well, he said, there isn't any secret to success, Bob. He said, it's a simple matter of figuring out what you absolutely love to do, and then make a decision to dedicate your life to it. Then every day, you're gonna be doing what you love to do. He said, the problem with most people is they never decide what they love to do, and they don't make a decision to dedicate their life to anything. They just go from one thing to the next. People have regrets. I mean, if you want to go to a nursing home and just feel that for a, half, for a minute, if you look into their eyes, you can see there's regret. Well, most people do, but most people don't do anything. You see, I often say... How do you do something? Well, there's where the goals come in. That's where the purpose for life comes in. You've got to have a main purpose. You've got to have a purpose for life and you've got to have meaningful goals. They've got to be meaningful. You're trading your life for it. Hmm. Like I often say in a seminar, I want you to imagine you're at the end of the road and you know you're at the end of the road. Your body's so weak, they've got you tied in a wheelchair or they've got you in a crib bed so you don't fall out, kill yourself. Right. Just imagine, all you can do is relive your life. I want you to imagine you're there and you go back and think, God, oh, I wonder if we had a move there, what would have happened? If we had started that company, remember we're gonna sell the house and start that company. If we had it done this, I wonder what would have happened. And then, God, if I could only do it over again. I said, wouldn't that be terrible? 
spend the last days of your life like that? Wouldn't it be better if you look back and say, wow, what a trip. God, I remember we did that. Remember, we blew our brains out on that. We lost everything we had. But you know, when you lose it big enough, it can be accelerating. And then we did this. And what you're doing is laying there and you're reliving your whole life. And that's the goal. Got to have the goal. I'm always asked, how do you stay so young? And I tell them, I don't hang around old people. And I said that, I think, sort of as a joke one time. But then I realized it was no joke. It's the truth. I, um, I don't mix with anybody my age. Um, I'm 85 years old in July. Um, so I was uh, born in 1934. That's a long time ago. Um, I don't go by age of anything. I become aware that age is um, it's a number and it has nothing to do with who we are or what we're going to do. And when we clearly understand that, our life will change. You know, the idea of 65 for retirement is pretty well accepted worldwide. And it was accepted by Otto von Bismarck when he was chancellor of Germany. Somebody said, you know, we should have an age where people can stop working, the government just send them a check. He said, that's a hell of a good idea. So he just arbitrarily picked 65. Well, a number of years later, when they were going to do it in America, they said, is anybody doing this? And they said, I think they're doing it in Germany. What age? 65. And it's accepted. 65 is the age of retirement. Why would we want to retire at all? See, I see retire as pullback from life. That's what it means. Why would we want to do that? I never want to do it. I never want to retire. I think that would be a despicable thing to do. When people go into forced retirement in nothing flat, they're dead. You see, we're not made for work. Work is made for us. And when we clearly understand that, um, I think things start to change for us. I, um, I think people should ask themselves, how old would they be if they forgot their age? If I forgot my age, I think I'd be around 48, maybe not even 50, 47, 48, maybe 46. Um, I like the late 40s, I think they're good years. I think that's how old I'd be. And uh, I lived like that's where I am. The idea of slowing down, or th that's just so foreign to my way of thinking. I, I, don't, I don't think that way. And um, the idea of retirement, it'll never happen to me. Um, I'm gonna go full tilt right until the show's over. That's my attitude towards it. I don't hang around old people. Most old people are old people. And they talk about old things, you know, and they're reminiscing all the time. We ought to believe that we're creative beings and there's nowhere we haven't gone that we can't go. And so let's get up and get moving. That's my attitude on age. When uh, President John Kennedy asked the father of the space program, the famous Dr. Werner von Braun, what it would take to build a rocket that would carry a person to the moon and bring him back safely to Earth, he answered him in five words. The will to do it. The will to do it. Pretty light, simple answer for such an enormous question. But I'm going to tell you something. The will to do it, that had a lot of power in it. What do we mean by that, the will to do it? Well, will is one of your higher faculties. You have perception, reason, memory, imagination, intuition, and the will. Will is a mental faculty that gives you the ability to hold one idea on the screen of the mind to the exclusion of all outside distractions. Do you know, it would be, you'd be hard pressed to figure out how many things are trying to grab your attention at any given time. But there's all kinds of things going on around that are begging your conscious attention. You can block them all out and keep one idea on the screen of the mind with your will. Will is a mental faculty that gives you the ability to hold one idea on the screen of the mind to the exclusion of all outside distractions. It's the will that gives you the ability to concentrate. Concentration is a powerful mental tool. How do you develop your will? I'll tell you. You take your pen or a little black marker and go opposite to your favorite chair. There's a wall opposite your favorite chair. Put a little dot on the wall. Do it when nobody sees you doing it and nobody will ever notice the dots there. Every time you sit in that favorite chair, focus on that dot. Bring all of your conscious attention to bear on the dot. 
Now, when you look at the, your mind will wander. That's okay. Don't feel bad because it wander. Bring it back to the dot. Every time it wanders, if you if you concentrate on the on that dot for um, a half a second, you'll probably set a family record. Our mind is so busy. You focus on the dot, you'll find your mind wander. Don't feel bad. Bring it back to the dot. You can get to the point where you can concentrate for quite a while. And I'm telling you, you concentrate for a while, you're developing great powers. Or get a candle in a candle holder and put it somewhere around your favorite chair. When you're alone, light the candle and stare at the flame and stare at that flame until you mentally become one with the flame. Now again, your mind's going to wander. Don't feel bad about it. Bring it back to the flame. Just bring it back to the flame. When you learn to concentrate on one thing, you can concentrate on anything because that is how you develop your will. Opportunity is an interesting word. And um, like most words, it's misunderstood. See, the average person is looking at opportunity as something they're going to get. So they're out looking to get something. Opportunity is what you're going to give. See, it's the person that's thinking of an idea. How can I do more? How can I provide more service for the people we provide service for? Do you know I spend almost all of my time thinking of how I can help you more than I'm helping you? I'm here in my studio. We spent a million dollars building a studio so that I can communicate more effectively with our clients. Opportunity is in giving. It's not receiving. It's not getting, it's giving, it's sharing, it's putting something out there. Success is a funny word. Nightingale had a great definition for it. He said a person's successful if they know where they are and they know where they're going and they're progressively moving in that direction. He said that success was the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Anyone that has a goal and they're moving towards it, they're successful. <clears throat> Most people think that you're successful if you have a lot of money. Quite often you have a lot of money if you're successful, but it isn't. I wouldn't say Mother Teresa has a lot of money. Okay. You know, but she's a pretty successful lady. Attracting what you actually want. I think James Allen put it very well in his little book, As a Man Thinketh. He said, you don't attract what you want. You attract what you are. Now think about that. If you want to attract what you want, you've got to see yourself already with it. You've got to understand that you've already got it. First of all, clearly understand this. Nothing is created or destroyed. That means everything's already here. If not in one state, certainly in another. Where did the iPhone come from? The iPhone came from a series of ideas that individuals entertained in their mind. And they kept holding the idea until the stuff came to them that enabled them to build the phone. The stuff had already been here. Nothing is created or destroyed. All science, all theology teach that. If nothing is created or destroyed, everything that is already here. Our problem is we've got to wait until we see it outside before we believe we've got it. Start dealing with the non-physical world, with the invisible world, with the world that you can't see through these little peepers that you've got here we call eyes. Start to see yourself mentally. You've been given the faculties to do that. Use your imagination. See yourself already in possession of the good you desire. That will flip your mind onto a specific frequency. And you do think on frequencies. It's on that frequency that good you desire is going to start coming toward you and you will start moving toward it. If you want to attract what you actually want, you've got to see yourself now already with it. And no, it's only a period of time until you moving toward it and it moving toward you and you become one with it. Stop and think of any large company. I don't care, anyone. Right. You can go to the leaders of that company and you can say, who are your stars? I mean the ones that are really making it happen. And they've all got a few. Say, what are they doing that's so different? Why don't you find out what they're doing and teach it to everybody? They oh, all, well, everybody couldn't do it. Why are they doing it? You know something? The stars don't know why they're stars. And they'll say, well, they're smart. Some of them aren't very smart. Smart's got nothing to do with it. They have shifted their paradigm. They've knocked the wall down and they built an image and they followed the rules. They just didn't know what they were doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I was earning over a million dollars a year. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I'd say I was cleaning offices. That was almost incidental. 
what I was doing, I was reading this every day. I was listening to the recordings every day. I was reprogramming my subconscious mind. What keeps people stuck month after month, year after year? 90 some percent of the population are stuck. You've got people graduating with all kinds of degrees and the results wouldn't indicate that they know very much at all. Most people don't understand what's going on inside. There's something that's stopping them and it's called a paradigm. See, when paradigms are in control, nothing changes, nothing. And that's why most people they get the same results year after year. People know how to do better than they're doing. The problem is they don't know why they're not doing what they know how to do. See, it's the paradigm that produces the result. And if we're going to change the result, there's only one way to do it. Just one, you're going to change the paradigm. A man's environment is a merciless mirror of him as a human being. And if he thinks his environment can stand a little improvement, all he has to do is improve and his environment will improve to reflect the changing man. All knowledge, all power is 100% evenly present in all places at the same time. Your spiritual DNA is perfect, so is mine. There's perfection within. What we've got to learn is draw it out. Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. When you watch a video and just get motivated, the science says you have a 35% chance of actually following through on your goals. That, that's not good enough, no? Not for you, Believe Nation, we gotta do something. But when you write it down and you create a specific plan of action for the next week, that number jumps to 91% chance of you following through. And when you commit to somebody else, like leaving a comment on this video, it jumps to 95%. You need to follow through on your goals. So what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your specific plan of action for the next week? Put it down in the comments below so I can celebrate you. Everybody wants to be happy, but not everybody is happy. Do you know, I could take you back to the man that gave me this book, Ray Stanford. I was a very unhappy individual. I was a sad soul, believe me. And I remember one day he said, Proctor, you're gonna have to change. He said, would you like to be happy? Well, I used to think that was something that happened to some people, but you weren't in control of it. I really never knew that I could control my own happiness. I did not know that. And I'm gonna tell you something. There's a whole lot of people do not know that. Otherwise, you wouldn't find so many people who are pretty sad. He's, I'm gonna tell you a secret, Proctor. And he said, if you get it, you can benefit from this till you're a very old man. He said, you are in control of your own happiness. Now he said, I'm gonna tell you why you're not happy. There's a power or a thought energy flowing into your consciousness. And you know what you do? You bottle it all up inside. All of your energy is focused on you. You are the only thing you think about. Poor me, I wish I had some money. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. But your thoughts are always about yourself. If you find someone else to help, if you can help someone, and I'm gonna tell you, there's a whole lot of people out there want help. If you will focus on helping other people, you're gonna be one happy cat. Now, I don't think I got it right away. But he knew probably I wasn't gonna get it right away. And so every time I saw him, he's who you've been helping. I don't know. See, I wasn't helping anybody. I was trying to figure out how to get some money, how to help me. I want you to think about this for a moment. There's so many people need help. Chapter 14 in The Science of Getting Rich is a powerful concept. Leave everyone with the impression of increase. If you do that, you're helping people. Happiness is always found and the person who is focusing on helping other people. If you want some amazing John Asaraf motivation, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Setting goals is an intellectual and imagined exercise that your conscious brain, right? 
I'm going to show you one of the little brains today from the city here on my desk. Your 